Jesse <clears throat> Baker is our city manager, and she's going to start with instructions on exiting the building in case of an emergency, as well as a review of our technology <laughs> options, which are always a work in progress. <laughs> Uh, so thank you to those who are joining us in the room. If there's an emergency, you can go out the rear of the auditorium on the left and right, and then turn left and right and go out either way and go outside. For those participating on the phone, thank you for joining us as well. If you'd like to make a comment during any agenda item, um, please turn your camera on and the chair will call on you, or you can indicate to me in the chat that you'd like to address the council and I'll have the chair call on you. Other than that, we are not monitoring the chat for content. All right. Thank you. And now it's time for agenda review. Are there any additions, deletions, or changes in order of the agenda items? No. Helen? No? All good? Okay. We're going to continue no. on with... No. No. Okay, good. Is there a lag time, too, between... No? Okay. All right. Uh, so now this is... The time when the members of the public can come forward and speak to us about anything that is not on our agenda. It's time for us to listen. Yes, Michael. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. I would like to know uh, where we are with the, the two um, conservation easements that are in the works, one for Wheeler nature park and one for uh, the Underwood Park. Um, I haven't had an update for a while and I said I would stay away and not waste your time by coming here to ask, but since I haven't heard anything, uh, I'm here. Um, I'd like to add that I think it's a, a bit of an insult to the citizens. Uh, it's kind of that nothing's been done. You know, this is something that was very important and il elicited a lot of public interest, both in the case of Wheeler and in the case of the Hubbard Park. Um, a lot of people put in a lot of volunteer hours, weeks, months, uh, to work on the Wheeler conservation easement plan and presented it to you, I don't know, many, many years ago. Um, I know the last thing I heard was that the survey, or at least the boundaries, had been pinned. Mm -hmm. So we, so the land trust, the mm -hmm. Vermont Land Trust, knew what they were getting into. But um, it doesn't appear to have any interest by the council in giving this priority, any kind of priority. And it really should be urgent now. After all these years, it should be top of the list. Okay. I think that we have been trusting that the staff has been keeping up, uh, you know, with their, their um, following through on the, you know, the decision of the council. So the decision of the council remains and stands firm. And last I heard, too, we were doing uh, the land survey. I don't know if this is the time for a response or if you want to do that during your update. I'm uh, happy to respond. I right, don't need a response right now, but I, I can speak from my own experience and running an organization with 600 odd employees, um, staff, at least my executive committee, that if I wanted something done, they needed to know that I needed it done in a hurry. And that's a message that I'm not sure is getting across. Um, I think, as I said, I think the, the citizens of this very, very lovely city deserve more. And I'll leave it at that All right. until the next meeting. Yes, please do. So it certainly is a priority of the councils. They've been very clear about that all along. It's a priority of mine as well. I'm sorry I'm disappointing you personally, but there are a lot of priorities in the city. To answer your question specifically, so the Wheeler... Uh, survey has been pinned. That was a requirement to enter into the easement. Um, that's been up now for, I think, about 30 days, and I think that that's around the time they wanted it up before they would move forward with the legal documents. On the Hubbard Park one, that is a discussion that um, we as staff will be talking to the council about um, later on in this agenda. 
um, and hopefully we'll move forward. And additionally, I'm very excited to share that um, we finally, after a year of a staff vacancy in the former Ashley Parker position that staffed the open space um, fund, have filled that vacancy about two weeks ago. Silken Kirshner joined us. So now we are going from zero staff managing those that priority to one staff managing that priority. So that's where we are. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Any other members of the public wish to speak tonight? Anybody online? I don't see any green lights. All right. Well, then we will move on to number five, which is the counselor's assignments. Happy Thanksgiving, Michael, since I see you're leaving. <laughs> counselor's assignments and reports on committee assignments, and we'll also follow up with our city manager on her report. Who would like to start? Andrew? Nothing since Thursday, Megan. Yeah. <laughs> I was here Thursday night, too. Yeah, very good. Nothing since Thursday night. Uh, nothing since Thursday. All Thank right. you for asking. All right. <laughs> Nothing since, since Thursday. <laughs> Very good. This is true. Yes, we have been meeting quite a lot, but just in case. And Jesse, you said you were going to give a bigger report. I, I have more updates tonight. There the we weekly go. council meetings do definitely cut back on the <laughs> updates, though. Um, so a couple of things for the council and community to be aware of. Um, so as folks have noticed, we have a lot of progress happening in city center, a lot of development going up. Um, in talking with Snyder Braverman, who are the master developers of um, the South Burlington, um, South Burlington Realty land, they are starting to lease up the commercial space in the key buildings right here on Market and Garden. As part of those lease conversations, they're starting to get a lot of questions about paid parking in city center. So that is something we are starting to explore with them. We're going to bring on a consultant to help think strategically about how to maximize the potential of the parking over time and ensure that we don't miss opportunities to bring in uh, vibrant and growing businesses to those um, new commercial spaces. So heads up that that is going to be coming your way at some point in the next... I would say three to nine months. Mm -hmm. um, we are also uh, kicking off our bike ped master plan. We are now calling it our active transportation plan. That's, as you know, funded through a grant from the Regional Planning Commission. Um, we are convening the advisory group now. Therefore, we're naming the advisory group now, and their first meeting will be in January. So stay tuned to see more of that plan being kicked off. Um, we would encourage the council community members, if you know people who are looking for work and are CDL drivers, we would very much welcome their application. We are currently down five public works employees with mm. CDLs. Um, that is likely going to impact our winter operations. It's a commercial, commercial driver's license. It's what allows folks to drive the really big snow plows. You, you Unfortunately, tell. they won't let me drive one. <laughs> It could be trained. Could be trained. Um, Public Arts Committee is also um, looking to come to you in January to commission a piece of public art. Um, they're specifically looking at the Chamberlain neighborhood, which I know is of interest to members of the uh, council. So heads up that that's coming your way in January. And then just a reminder on this holiday week that our uh, city hall and library will be closing at 4.30 on Wednesday. Um, the library will reopen at 9 Saturday morning for regular Saturday hours, but will not be open on Friday. And, of course, our police, fire, and dispatch crews will be here 24 hours a day if you are in need of them. That's all I have. Very good. So Thank you. <laughs> or if you do, we will be there. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. And we are now moving on to item number six, which is the consent agenda. And that includes signing disbursements after we consider and approve them. Approving the minutes from three past meetings, October 2nd, October 16th, and October 30th. So we're not weekly. We're not weekly. <laughs> uh, we also have the September and October financials. And we also have... Um, some narratives that we looked at, the fiscal year 24, quarter one financial narratives. Um, ready to entertain a motion to approve. One procedural. I'm not sure I should approve those minutes because I was not on the council at the time, but it is part of the package. You can. There's nothing preventing right. you from. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. 
I move that we approve the uh, items in the consent agenda. I second. Very good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And Helen? Aye. Very good. Thank you. All right. So that moves on to number seven, where we have a uh, few appointments to consider. I walked in with Brittany here. Um, and so we're going to be looking at both the Energy Committee and the um, CCTV Board of Trustees, Town Meeting TV Board of Trustees, um, a trustee from South Burlington. Did you want to kick us off, Jesse? I see your name there. Sure. Uh, so you have two candidates to consider for the Energy Committee, Brittany and Marley, who I don't yet see. Um, and then Corey to consider for town meeting TV. Um, the one comment I would make to the group about Corey is she is traveling today, so didn't know if she would be able to join. Um, she was the former communications director for the school district, mm -hmm. um, so is very um, familiar with our community and with um, how much great service town meeting TV provides to our neighbors. So I would recommend you consider her appointment if she's not able to join us today. Mm -hmm, right. Oh, she is here. I see her name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Corey's here. Excellent. Okay, we're 20 minutes early. We are 20 minutes early. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I see. can we can we interview Corey and sure. at least take that up? And, and we have Brittany here, too, for the Energy Committee. Yeah. But isn't there a second Energy yes, candidate there is. that's not there yet? Yes. All right. Yes, we certainly can. So I would... Perhaps call on Corey, since she is online. Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Welcome. How okay. are you? Yes. Thank you. Good. Uh, <laughs> and thanks for uh, allowing this this option tonight. Uh, while I'm in in transit, you know, I turn on my camera, but it is dark where I'm pulled over. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to be interviewed for this. Um, I'm happy to entertain any questions you have. Um, Jesse, thank you for the intro. Um, I am familiar with um, almost almost all of, all of you um, from my time working at the other paper too, before mm -hmm. I was at the district. Um, and I, I have the time to uh, commit to this uh, this committee. I love Town Meeting TV. It is such a valuable resource, um, especially now. I mean, <laughs> when I was doing the meetings, we didn't have the live stream going. Uh, so this is just a real benefit in terms of access to all of you and uh, all of the things that are happening in our neighboring communities. Yeah. You clearly have an extensive background that prepares you, I think, for for this position. I think come forward with interest as well. Um, and are you familiar with town meeting TV meetings and how their operations work? Have you been able to get to know Lauren Glenn Davidian, who is now the outgoing president, and our new president, Megan O'Rourke? Not Lauren, although I am familiar with uh, her work at Town Meeting TV, but I have been in communication with Megan and yes. Jordan as well. Fabulous. Um, and uh, as soon as I saw the position was available, I contacted Megan and have been back and forth with her a little bit just to get a feel for how the meetings are structured, uh, what the trustee would be doing, and uh, you know when they meet, for how long, uh, and uh, that seemed to fit well with my current schedule. Fabulous! Wow. See, to give someone who's <laughs> who's been dealing with um, reporting on things the job. I think you you did a good job figuring out the facts of the of the assignment. Yeah, I think that Helen and I can both uh, speak to it. We both are the previous the previous two trustees. Um, Helen, I don't know if you want to speak up or if I'm, you can jump in if I'm not saying something. But the primary uh, function is really to make sure that uh, Town Meeting TV, uh, you know, maintains a solid footing financially. Uh, we work also on policy development to make sure, you know, that 
there is not only freedom of speech, but also free access, you know, equal access to, to speech, uh, particularly during uh, campaign and election time. Um, there's also okay. equipment. Uh, there are always new changes occurring, and so discussing, you know, the needs, the, the capital needs of, of uh, Town Meeting TV. Um, and, you know, I, I haven't been able to talk with Megan about her ideas, and I think it's kind of an exciting time for a new trustee to join because it's really going to be, um, I think, a, a, a new esprit de corps that's going to be developing uh, with Megan now at the helm. And, and so I think that that will be something that you will be potentially, and I think likely, <laughs> working on developing with everybody there. But it, it's generally, um, I would say, a really committed group of trustees committed to, uh, you know, equal access to information, equal access to, to being able to, to, you know, raise your voice and speak up, equal access to, um, you know, your elected officials. All these things are very much part and parcel with what a good journalist does. So you, you're very much fit the bill, Corey. Any other comments or questions or... Helen, did you want to add? I, I would only add that I think, Corey, you'd be great. And I totally support your um, interest and certainly will vote for you. Um, I would just add that there's also the, the opportunity to um, get to know some other um, often select board members in other communities, mm -hmm. which I think can be a positive help um, as the the group of you really work to um, continue to make sure that um, Town Meeting TV is viable. We are, um, we did, a, I think everyone saw them in the notes, did get some, or the legislature did commit a million dollars to support Town Meeting TVs all over the um, state. And um, that's a, an important conversation with the legislature that will continue. So I think okay. you will, would serve us well in your capacity to communicate and be part of that board. Oh, thank you so much, Megan and Helen. Uh, that was uh, actually a question I was going to ask. I know you always ask candidates if they have any questions for you. And I know I was I knew you had both served on the on town meeting TV. And thank you for sharing your insight. Yeah, yeah. No, they're really committed. It's a great group. Anybody? Sure. So uh, I support Corey for this. Um, Corey comes from that long line mm -hmm. of very fair, articulate, mm -hmm. extremely good writers for the other papers, such as Corey and Miranda and Maddie, uh, who you know, attended hundreds of meetings and um, wrote about some very complex mm -hmm. matters that the city was <laughs> involved in over the years. So. Um, I really in, enjoyed her writing and, and her accuracy, and so I think this is a good fit. Oh, thanks, Tim. Any other questions that you would have for us, Corey? Uh, yes, just one, and that is, uh, I know that because, uh, you know, the two of you are on the council, when you do your uh, council, you know, reports from committee assignments, how frequently uh, are you expecting a trustee to give you updates? Well, well I, I would hope that if there's something important to share mm -hmm. that you either would tune in um, via Zoom to share that or potentially um, write a little paragraph and send it to the council and the um, city manager and, and we can stay apprised that way. If you have a, a specific question or need to know, you know, where the council is, then, you know, by all means, that would be an important time to um, uh, speak up and, and be active at one of our council meetings. Okay, perfect. Does that sound okay to the other, the rest of the counselors? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think you need to be there Right. Once a month, unless <laughs> it's it's important or if that's what you would prefer versus just writing a paragraph saying this is what we've talked about and these are the issues and, you know, does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I would I would agree that it we are definitely committed to keeping Town Meeting TV, uh, you know, actively uh, engaged also in in our meeting structure. Uh, you know, as a someone who uh, who really relies on that communication as well as using it for information, I know that there are members of the public who do as well, and and so it serves both elected officials and members of the public. And, and so just knowing that we are very much committed to what you do, Corey, so if ever, you know, anything appears to, to require the city's support, I think that's when you could come forward, you know, and, and really yeah. just yeah. inform us and give us, you know, enough time to, to be able to, to consider as well, because it, depending on what it might be. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. absolutely. That sounds good to me. Very good. Excellent. Um, does anybody just want to make a motion or should we go through the, the full process here and wait till the I'll end? I'll make a motion to um, <laughs> appoint Corey to the, um, as a self Burlington representative to Town Meeting TV. Very good. Second. Very good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. One more thing to be thankful for. Thank you, Corey. We wanted you to go away with. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that was well, thank you so decision. much. <laughs> and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. All right. Let us keep. We have Brittany Baldwin, who's here for the Energy Committee. And is there just one spot available for the Energy Committee or two spots available for the Energy Committee? I believe there's just one, but I will just look that one. up. For you. Okay. All right, and I do see that Marley now is online, so we have both of our, both of our candidates. Well, welcome, Brittany. Um, I think it's fabulous that one of our district teachers <laughs> is applying for, to be on one of our committees. That's that's really meaningful for me, uh, as as a teacher, as someone who who teaches. Um, so I just want to welcome you and to say that. Uh, you are setting an example for all of your students, and I think it's fabulous. Um, what led you to apply? I, I read about your, your interest, of course, but you can develop on that if you want to. Yes, well, um, I got to know Carrie McLaughlin, who's on. Is the, is the mic on? You can touch the button. It to looks make sure on. Okay, Just a little speak closer. more closer. Yeah. Um, so I got to know Carrie, who's on the committee. And I had worked with her a little bit over the summer. Um, she was looking for some feedback and support with how to reach out and educate um, children, but also thereby engage more young families in some of the work and um, education and events that the committee was working on. So we had worked together. I provided some ideas for um, small lessons that they could do and, you know, things of that nature and ways to communicate sort of the scientific part of what they want to communicate energy-wise, but in a way that doesn't, um, you know, oversimplify it, but deliver in a way that they could understand and engage with. Um, and also of just thinking about how to make the events a little bit more um, engaging and hands-on. So following that, she, you know, found out about this opportunity and sort of convinced me. Um, and I actually got pretty excited about it. Um, you know, I really enjoy giving back to my community and being engaged and feels like a good time to be able to um, give back more of my time to the community. Of course, I do that a lot during my work day as well, but um, I was excited about it. And, you know, she expressed that the work that I did just through communicating over the summer is a need that the committee has as one of their goals is to, you know, educate and share important information. So I feel that my skills in that way could be supportive to the committee. Great. And did she tell you the meeting time? Was it something that will work yes. with your schedule? And of course, all of that is to be, again, decided upon as, as a full committee, once the committee convenes as a 
with it with a new member. Yes, very she good. But the commitment, a lot of that. the the timing, and the commitment, all of that. Very good, very good. Well, you've definitely laid out kind of a, a work plan for yourself. Are there questions that members of our council have for Brittany? Just tell tell me a little bit about what you teach. Kindergarten. Kindergarten. <laughs> but I've taught <laughs> up through fourth in the past as well. Brittany, thank you for um, coming down and um, your interest in the committee. I'm just are the kind of interested in hearing are there kind of one or two discrete projects that you're thinking about that you'd love to drive forward? So in terms of like the education the projects and sharing oh. out, yeah. So um, one thing that she and I had talked about over the summer was thinking about how families could engage more with, um, you know, helping them understand different types of renewable energy. There are a lot of hands-on experiments that kids can do to explore that. Um, and we talked about pairing that with um, information that adults would be receiving at the same time about, you know, resources in our community that they could connect with so just pairing it in that way um, and as well as you know sharing information about um, activities and events that families can do such as taking our buses and our bike paths and walking and things like that instead of driving mm -hmm. so be like maybe the energy committee like putting on an event where they would do this demonstration and like like um Maybe put it up on the website or flyers or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's definitely where I see my skill set being supportive to them. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about your role within the district. Is there perhaps a ready and willing audience to to help you distribute these things to to district families, or is that something that you could not do as a as an employee of the district? Um, I would have to find out more about that. You know, I'm definitely coming at this just as a resident of South yeah. Burlington. Um, obviously, my skill set as a teacher is what led me here. Um, but I would have to investigate more what a partnership would look like in that way. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Yeah. Have you uh, attended any of the Energy Committee meetings? Did I not hear that or did I? I didn't attend meetings. We were just meeting informally um, so I could provide some information and support with those processes. Okay. And they meet twice a month, right? Once a month. Once a month? Oh, that's right. Once a month. Okay. Yeah. They should meet twice a month. Just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. All right. Helen, did you have any questions for Brittany? Uh, no, I, I think they were asked. Um, I, I would be um, supportive of, um, Brittany, you finding out more about how the role or your role as a teacher um, could um, get expanded to, to the school curriculum or something like that. And I understand you don't know that now, and that wasn't the purpose for you to join this um, committee. But I think that's a, um, a an important connection that potentially can be built upon and and would be um, helpful. So I appreciate your interest. Can I expand on that for a moment, just to, sure. just to let you know, there is a, a school climate task force, and one of the planks mm -hmm. is is curriculum. Oh well, there. Yeah. Right, and you were invited by the superintendent to be on that task yes. force. So there clearly is interest. Mm -hmm. uh, on the part of the school district's administration yeah. to have, yeah. yeah. Oh, very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Brittany. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, did you have any questions for us? I forgot to ask you that one question. Mm -hmm. No. All right. Thanks. One and one vacancy. All right. So Marley, is it Hauser, the last name? Am I pronouncing that correctly, it is Marley? Hauser. Yeah, you are. Can you see me as well? All right. Well, welcome. And we are um, 
going to be thinking about just one position, unfortunately. So we have, I know, two excellent candidates here. Um, you also are working on climate equity, uh, the collaboration, um, and you can tell us a little bit about what led you to apply to the job more, you know, develop more on what you wrote in your application. Yeah, sure thing. Um, and I'll start off by apologizing for not being in person. I was um, exposed to COVID through my family, so I figured that would be the best option to be online. Um, we thank you. And I'll also <laughs> add, yeah, of course, I'll also add that um, from the sound of it, it seems like Brittany would be an excellent uh, candidate for this position as well. And I say that just because I have the utmost respect for teachers and what they do from day to day. So um, recognizing that there's only one position, I am grateful for the opportunity to share with you all, but um, sounds like Brittany would be a great fit as well. Um, yeah, so as I explained in my application, I grew up in Vermont. Um, I've moved away since and come back several times. Um, and sort of been in and out of the state. But after finishing my master's in public administration and environmental policy, I was looking to um, sort of put down roots and find a community that I could be a part of. Um, and so I found myself in South Burlington and some of that was pretty intentional, recognizing that there's a lot of expansion happening within this community. Um, and I'm sort of excited to see the, the direction that that goes, because I have a feeling the demographics are going to change um, and it's going to bring some new opportunities and new people into the community. Um, and so I, you know, I'm living in South Burlington and almost immediately when I got here, I started looking for opportunities to be more involved in the community. Um, and one of the opportunities that I came across was on Front Porch Forum. It was a posting for the energy festival that um, MJ Real had put up there. Um, and I was like, that sounds great. That, that sounds right up my alley. I'd love to be a part of that if I can. And so I reached out to her um, and I ended up volunteering at that festival. But then we had a series of other conversations where she um, sort of was telling me about the energy committee and recommended that I look into applying and see if it's something that I was interested in. Um, and it definitely was, it's something that resonates really strongly with the work that I do on a daily basis. Um, and in addition to that, I, I lived at home with my mom for about a year after I graduated from grad school and she's a member of the, the energy committee first. Um, and so I had a lot of conversations with her about her role on that and she was sort of bouncing issues off of me. Um, and at one point she had actually encouraged me to apply for the committee there, but I was planning to relocate to South Burlington anyways. So I um, figured that I, that was not a good fit, but um, long story short, I um, found that opportunity and it seemed like a really great way to get more involved with the community and to give back to the community. Um, and I attended one uh, meeting, I think it was the October meeting and having sat through that meeting, I can definitely see that there's real opportunity for impact. Um, so yeah, that's, I'll, I'll leave it open for any additional questions yeah. um, from you all. Yeah, well, what I see in your application is that you're very interested in inclusivity and in making our policy decisions be informed by what you call human scaled thinking. Could you develop that idea a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I, I and that um, was actually one of the values that were outlined in the, um, in the, the plan that was uh, referenced in the application. But then when I went into the actual plan, I didn't see it as much, but it definitely, you know, it resonates with the, the work that I do on a daily basis. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's recognizing that there's, um, that the concept of energy production and usage can be very removed from the human aspect. I mean, it's, you can get into the science and the nitty gritty details of it, but at the end of the day, um, it's humans that are using it, it's humans that are producing it, and it's our environment that's being impacted. And so I think that there's a real need to ensure that they're consistently centered in how 
we approach the things we do in this area. Um, and so I think just, you know, consistently centering the human element, remembering that there are real people impacted by these policies that are being made um, and potentially voices in spaces that aren't, uh, there, there aren't voices in spaces where they should be. And so ensuring that um, there are always, you know, the right people at the table, the right voices being heard mm -hmm. so that all humans um, are being centered in that work. And how would you go about doing that? How would you do that outreach or, or advise the members of the Energy Committee uh, on ways of bringing more people uh, to uh, the sources of information or to financial resources or to the various things that, that we need to do <laughs> in order to um, convert, right? This yeah, conversion definitely. that has I mean, to I happen. Think yeah, I think it's, um, you know, really just a multifaceted approach and coming at it from as many different angles as possible. And so part of that is tapping into, you know, the early education system, like Brittany's talking about. Part of it is um, communications campaigns or putting out, you know, surveys to get feedback from the community, um, hosting events to bring people into that circle. But then I think you also sort of have to break it down at the communications level and recognize that different there needs to be different means of communicating that to ensure that it's you know as equitable and inclusive as possible and so it's ensuring that the the communications you are putting out are um not so heavily steeped in the science of it that the average citizen can understand what they're reading or that it's written in different languages to ensure that people who don't speak English as a primary language can understand it. Um, or having the, you know, curriculum that's geared towards students, but then also having something that works for adults as well. And so really just ensuring that you're checking as many boxes as possible um, is, I think, at the end of the day, the, the best thing you can do. And then also sort of taking a step back and, and consistently checking to make sure that you have as many um, voices as possible contributing to whatever input you're looking for. All right, thank you. Are there any follow-up questions? Yes, uh, Councillor Andrew Chalnick has some, Marley. Hi, Marley, thanks for applying. Can you just tell me a little bit about how long you've been with NWF and what you what you do there? Is that is Climate Equity Coalition like a, um, a group within National Wildlife Federation, is that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it is often confusing for people to grasp. We're still working on how to best articulate it so that people understand what we do. So I appreciate you asking because it's an opportunity to, to practice that. Um, but National Wildlife Federation, if anyone is familiar with it, is a fairly large um, environmental organization in in the US, it's one of what they consider the big greens. Um, and Climate Equity Collaborative is essentially an initiative of the National Wildlife Federation. So NWF is one of the core partners that helped to create Climate Equity Collaborative. Um, and NWF is essentially the backbone organization for CEC for the Climate Equity Collaborative. But there are um, other partners involved in that as well. There's the Children's Environmental Health Network. There's We Act for Environmental Justice, which is based in uh, New York City. And we're in the process of bringing more partners on board. Um, but essentially, if you distill the work down, the idea is to create as many on-ramps as possible for primarily non-traditional organizations or entities to get involved in the um, climate action space, particularly centering um, equity action. And in terms of what that looks like in practice, um, you know, one of our key partners at the moment, uh, the, one of the partnerships we're developing is with the semiconductor industry, which is not an industry that you would typically think about um, taking equitable climate action, but there's a real opportunity for impact there. And it's a massively expanding industry. You know, I think it's Global Foundries that has their um, new space here in the Burlington area. Um, and so it's, it's really at the end of the day about building those partnerships um, and bringing resources and um, 
different partners to the table to really work around these issues. That was that was great. And how long have you been doing that, Marley? Um, yeah, so I started off as a fellow because it was really the only position that they had the funding for. Um, and I volunteered my time actually for like the first four months and then they formalized the position. So I did that for about eight months and then I transitioned into um, a full-time role, senior coordinator role in the last like four months. So it's been going on, I think, two years um, at the end of this year. Okay, thank you. Very good. Any other questions? No, Helen, do you have a question for Marley? No, very good. Well, thank you very much, Marley. And I think that uh, since we have two excellent candidates, we're going to have to think about this. We're, uh, did we want to go into an executive, um, uh, what do we call it, session, thank you, tonight or, I mean, now or, or later? Sorry? Yeah, so we'll do it later. Okay, and then the process is is that we will make a decision, and then that that will be communicated tomorrow so to our candidates. Or? It will be communicated tomorrow because you have a quite long executive session at the end of this meeting. What I would recommend is that you can make a recommendation tonight, and then I'll have you uh, approve it on the consent agenda at the next meeting. But certainly, oh, we'll I let see. the candidates know to not keep them on edge for two weeks. <laughs> All right. All right. So. Enjoy your Thanksgivings, and you'll hear from us in December. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you both. Thank you. Two excellent candidates. This is when we want you both. <laughs> we'll figure out <laughs> how to do that. Okay. We're going to move on then to the next item, which is number eight. It is worn for seven, and we are now a little bit late, but hopefully it's okay. Uh, this is our public hearing on land development regulation amendments uh, number LDR-23-03, multiple principal structures on a lot, number LDR-23-04, updates to the city center form-based code on buildings on outside of road corners and interstate facade standards, and number LDR-23-05, minor and technical amendments. And our director of planning and zoning, Paul Connor. Can you take this away? I sure can. Uh, thanks, everybody. Paul Connor, Director of Planning and Zoning. Do we need um, to enter into public hearing? Maybe after he gives us a little, sure. he tees it up, and then we can enter into public hearing. Uh, you have um, three amendments in front of you, as uh, Councillor Emery just said. Um, one is a minor adjustment to the city center form-based code to allow for buildings to have a little bit more of a setback from the street frontage when they're on the interior of an L. The other two are tidy up items. One is to make sure that um, we are consistent in uh, with an amendment that we made a year and a half ago related to the Natural Resource Protection District um, that makes sure that uh, at the time changing it from a uh, allowing three single family homes to be consolidated no more units but into a single building so it takes up less space. And then the third one is to uh, return to consistency with the state law requiring that municipalities uh, allow for mobile home parks. Um, it was identified uh, as sort of an unintended consequence of changes to our regulations that we had um, severely limited them previously. So this allows for an exception um, to the one building, one principal structure on a lot. A mobile home park is defined under state statute as more than two homes on a lot, so therefore um, there was an inconsistency there. So we just made that um, a clarification under the allowance for buildings on a lot to return to compliance or consistency with the state law. So mm -hmm. um, you are invited to open your public hearing. We did right, not good. receive any comments. And this all comments. has to do with S100, the, the home? Uh, no, that actually is a pre-existing law that we... Oh, it's pre um, okay. That, that we identified through some of our fair housing training that we were, um, we could have stronger compliance with. We were not out of compliance, but we were not, maybe not fully meeting the spirit. Okay, very good. Now I'll entertain a... Sure, so I'll move that we uh, open a public hearing on the land development regulation amendments that you previously described. Is there a second? second? Very good. All in favor? Aye. 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 And Helen? Very good. All right, we are now in a public hearing, and we are here to hear from the public on these three as proposed. Linda, service, I see you've turned on your camera. I have given your, Barb, I'm sorry. 
I'm <laughs> I have to take off my glasses. It's okay, Linda Bailey's right below me. <laughs> Barb Service, thank you. I am combining two names. Okay. And I've, okay. I, uh, please go ahead and identify great. yourself since I have completely confused our note taker. <laughs> okay, Barb Service, I live in Summer Woods um, in South Burlington and I had not intended to speak, but if I heard Paul correctly, um, one of these is to allow a bit more setback from the street. And any time we can do that, I am in full support of it. It's one of those things that bothers me the most about Market Street right now is that it is a dark street because things are so close to the street. Um, and there's sort of no place for people to stand and talk and have a conversation or kids to play a little bit. Um, and so I'm in full support of anything that uh, increases the setback. Thanks. All right. Are there other members of the public who'd like to speak? Okay. I don't see anybody else. Would you like to close the public hearing and then we can... I'll move that we close the public hearing. Is there a motion to second? A second? Very good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Helen. <laughs> All right. So is there any discussion? All right. Would you like a motion? Sure. <laughs> so I would move that we approve land development regulations amendments LDR 23-03 and multiple principal structures on a lot LDR 23-04 updates to the city center form based code on buildings on outside of road corners and interstate facade standards and LDR 23-05 minor and technical amendments. I second. Very good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. That was easy, right? Very good. So we are running very ahead of schedule. Very much. This is exhausting. Yay! <laughs> All right. My, is Jordan my time in the room? Estimating. Or? No, I didn't think so. In 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Let's see. And Tom DiPietro is not here. Is either? And. Well, we could talk ARPA funds. Yeah, we could. Martha and I are both here. We could have Colin come down and talk about the school requests, although I, I'm not sure if Kate was right. or Violet were playing to participate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk ARPA. Because we, we have lots of time here. We have, <laughs> we have 50 minutes. I'm going to start putting uh, more specific language on our agenda saying, times are estimated. Please be here well in advance. Okay, um, so uh, we provided you an update to our standing ARPA agenda. Um, on that, that agenda, you will see we have uh, 2.1 million remaining in ARPA funds to be allocated. That includes um, the interest earned to date. Uh, Martha, our finance director, very wisely is, is uh, maintaining our ARPA funds in a separate account that's interest bearing and is rolling that, that interest back into the account. Um, this is one of the very unusual federal grants we got that um, we were fronted the money as opposed to pulling it down over time. Mm -hmm. Um, so at your, and just as a reminder to the council, uh, your obligation is to allocate the funds by December 2024, so 13 months from that now, and then spend them by December 2026. Um, I, uh, so that's that. Um, I did just want to, an update that has happened since we last met is we, I did mention at a previous meeting, we met with the state director for uh, Con Congresswoman Ballant um, and asked him about the possibility that these funds would be clawed back at some point if they were unspent. Um, and he thought it was highly unlikely that the municipal allocations would be clawed back since they are dollars sitting in our bank account. It's much more likely that ARPA funds for which programs have yet to be written or things like that would be clawed back before this. So I, I'm less concerned about that than I previously had been. So at your September 18th meeting, um, and one other background point, because the, we um, took the, this funds as lost revenue, you can use it for any municipal purpose. Mm -hmm. So at your September 18th meeting, you 
talked about it. Um, you've gotten lots of feedback from the community, from committees. You talked about a kind of a list of ideas. Um, those are presented to you here in total. Um, I'm happy to entertain any discussion you want to have tonight. My recommendation would be that because there are ARPA implications in the proposed FY25 budget that we will bring you on December 4th, um, that you don't make additional decisions until you receive that budget. Um, but it's certainly you wanted to have this come back to you, so here it is back, and we can talk through any of these ideas if you would like. Well, a question I have right off the top is we've been using ARPA and our surplus kind of interchangeably, and I have protested that a little bit. Um, so I would like to know how much we have left in our surplus as well. Okay. I'm, Martha, can you look that up while we're chatting? Thanks. Were there other questions? Uh, I, saw I, Helen. Like, yeah. I have a question. Um, and on this list is, I think it's, I can't bring it up, but it's for, I think about $400,000 for child, child care. care. And would you refresh my memory? I had forgot. I mean, I know we talked about it, but what what were we talking about that or we got to four hundred thousand dollars? It may have been. Does anyone remember? I don't remember exactly how you got to four hundred thousand. It is something that the Economic Development Committee is working on. Um, I think previously, how we how the council has talked about it is. Uh, using those funds the way we use the previous ARPA allocation for affordable housing, in other words, issuing an RFP to the community to see how child care providers would leverage funds to expand capacity. Um, okay. But I don't, do you know more about what the economic development I, I think that they were, uh, after hearing about the Woodstock project where they, uh, made grant money available to, uh, I think, a couple of businesses. They were like chicken and egg situations where they they needed money to uh, hire somebody and then train them for six months before they could then give them their own classroom. So in order to take that extra person in, they wouldn't be earning any income because they wouldn't have any new kids for six mm -hmm. months. Once the person was trained, then they could bring in another classroom of kids. Then they would have income. So... It was that type of, or, or else it was the refurbishing of, you know, uh, or adding in a couple more rooms in, in the, you know, in the next unit over of some rental, you know, some space, business space that they had. So, you know, there were, there were capital costs involved and then there were training costs they were trying to help cover. Yeah. And my recollection, I did go back to look at the meeting. We did not include it in the um, kind of list that we had come down to. We had included... Um, the Arts and Culture Master Plan, the Village Green, uh, the Parks Capital Improvement Plan, which also included um, some uh, upgrades at the, uh, the Dorset Athletic Fields, um, the Climate Action Plan, uh, the System Modernization, and the Pennies for Path match. But the rest, I don't recall. That is what I recall exactly what you're saying, Megan. Yeah. This, this list doesn't seem entirely familiar to me. Right. It's not what I recall us agreeing to. Well, it might have been discussed, but it's not what Helen at the end kind of gave yeah. a, as a wrap. This is what we, yeah. we've come down on. Right. Yeah, that's why I was questioning. I, I, I couldn't remember. Thank you, Tim. That, that reminds me um, of what the... Economic Development right. Committee had suggested, but I, I would agree with Andrew. I don't recall saying, "Yeah, that that makes the cut for us." Um, and frankly, I'm not sure it does for me now. I mean, it sounds like a great program and all. I, I just, um, I guess, I just kind of feel like the child care issue is enormously important, but I really, that's one thing I don't see personally as a um, city centered um, solution generator. I see it far more as a regional or statewide, but that's just, my bias, I guess. And the pre-K has just now gone through with the state, too. So they'll be right. 
providing more funding for that as well. And that we and we talked mm -hmm. about that as a, as one of the reasons why we didn't put on the list. Yeah. I think that. Um, so that's just you know. So I, I I understand where you're coming from on that, but um, I think that there are specific localities within the state that if they have the funds available to make them available for particular businesses that want to expand, right, then there's an opportunity there if there's money. And even though currently the city doesn't have that expertise, like you said, right, um, which we understand, that might be something that we do want to explore, maybe not to the tune of $400,000, but um, if this is ARPA money, right? So we've been talking about child care mm -hmm. for a long time. So if you want to make a difference, right. this is where we need to try. So I just want to make that point before we we potentially strike it from the list to some degree. I also don't recall. Well, I, I guess I, I would, in a sense, like to know, I mean, there's ARPA money that came to the communities, but there's also ARPA money that went to the state. And I just, in the back of my mind, I kind of remember that there was significant dollars in the state appropriation to support childcare yes. to a greater extent. And so, um, you know, I, I- I think it was 12 million, am I right on that? Or that's the number that- I don't know, it seemed like a lot. So that's just why, Tim, I, I'm holding off a little bit. 400,000 is, is a fair chunk. And when I look at the list, I, I think our, um, the need for a little more capital in the climate action plan would be more aligned in many ways with how the city has positioned itself and gotten ready for and is planning to make some real um, strides. That's all. You know, it's all a matter of priorities, I guess. Right. I just, I don't know what the state's plan is and what their you know, structure will be for distributing money and, and whether they'll favor the rural towns over the bigger cities or not. And I would hate to get passed over to some degree. And and, um, and we have talked about child care inequities ever since the pandemic struck. And, you know, if we mm -hmm. want to take a role, we got to do something. And this is, this could be the time. I, anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the state would... Well, the, the state yeah. would would provide um, child care scholarship with that money more than this more than the city would with vouchers vouchers yeah I think that's the, I don't I, I think first pass that this wasn't supposed to be voucher oriented oh, okay okay well uh, perhaps when we find out what the final figure is or the current figure I should say for the um, um, reserve um, then, you know, maybe we can parse this out differently. Yeah, there was also the, the uh, Habitat for Humanity and the, uh, you know, d d injecting $400,000 in order to purchase land, which would allow them to start that virtuous cycle. Um, that was also a request for use of the ARPA funds. I just want to make sure that that is included here in I think discussion. that was $500,000. Maybe it was. Maybe it was five hundred. And then, uh, then one hundred and fifty for the um, our, our fund, our own affordable housing trust fund. If, if this idea came from the Economic Development Committee, um, can you mm -hmm. remind me what their thought was on that and how how it was how it was to be used? Well, um, if a family has adequate child care, then they will be able to participate more fully in the labor force. So it would be subsidy or voucher or no? It would. The idea was that based upon this this interview they did with a representative from Woodstock, and the, the Woodstock had a similar committee, and and what they did was they were able to create kind of a revolving loan fund uh, mm -hmm. for okay. new or, or existing um, you know healthcare business. I'm sorry, uh, childcare businesses mm -hmm. that needed or wanted to expand but couldn't mm -hmm. because they didn't have the seed money to to start that process. So li licensing requirements. So so it'd be more more along the line of capital. Capital improvements for Capital licensing. and or paying for the person to be an employee while they're being trained because they don't create an income uh, if they don't have kids. <laughs> yeah. So 
so maybe a, a description of this, a better description, if it is in fact this revolving fund, would be a child care revolving fund or child care center revolving fund. <laughs> would, would you like me to go back to the Economic Development Committee and get some clarity on this? Uh, that would be, yeah, I appreciate that. Okay. Oh, well, I definitely would need it. So. <laughs> don't Excuse recall me. us agreeing on using ARPA for the lights. It's 125 million. It's just in the other paper, Act 76. 127 million, 125 million dollars annually into early childhood education. Just wanted, I found the number. <laughs> Forgot a zero. So just to be clear, you haven't ag six. agreed no, on no, any I'm of the ideas yet. We... This was the list of ideas you had right. played with on the 18th. And so I want no, to No, but it wasn't on the list of things I think that Helen and we all kind of said, yeah, this, this makes sense as the pared down list. I, I don't think it was on the, but. Right. But it was discussed. It was discussed. Right. Right. But we had well, made some decisions. I'm, I'm willing to decisions. discuss it further <laughs> with a little more information. That's all. Could we know how much is left in the surplus? Because the fire, the um, stoplight is $350,000 and it's great. But it's not as transformative as perhaps. It is transformative, <laughs> but perhaps not as transformative as some of these things. Thank you, Martha. So I didn't hear. What was the figure? Martha's she's coming to the table up, now. She's getting up to oh. the microphone. Okay. Yeah, the last console allocation on the plus one was September 18, and currently we have 4.1 million. Four five one. Yep. Thousand. Four point one million. But is that with including the cash, the reserve cash on hand? No, nope, that's not. So what's the available if we get down to that limit of eight percent? So remember, your fund balance policy right now requires you to hold a minimum balance. Right. So we have the days cash on hand of I think it's eight point six percent. And then you have a range up to 16% mm -hmm. that you can maintain without um, further discussion about returning funds. So that difference is really the, the, mm -hmm. the amount available. we would only, we would ever ask you to allocate. 689,000. Oh, I thought it was 2 million. Okay. So how much is left? Six eighty nine. dollars Six hundred eighty nine dollars. Uh thousand. Thousand. Six hundred eighty nine thousand. Okay. I just I, know, I was like sorry, I need you here. She's I know enjoying. she's got those few extra not yeah, zeros that all right. Thanks. So did you hear that, Helen? Six hundred eighty nine thousand dollars. I did. I did, yeah. It's better than six hundred and nine thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and it's totally at a disposal, more or less. More or less. I mean, it is your active savings account. So to the extent that there's um, an emergency or a big grant opportunity that we need grant match for, you know, it's, it's thing, it's, I would discourage you from spending that down to zero just because that eliminates any other opportunities you have through next August. Um, but it is, Technically, you can allocate it down to that level. But what I would say is that the Heinsberg and Market Street light could be seen as something that came out of there, <clears throat> and that would give us 350 more. Of our Right. Or you could split it, too. <clears throat> or you don't. <laughs> I mean, the okay. same thing with the DPW electric lawnmower. I think it's great, but ideally, you know, that wouldn't be coming from ARPA either, to my mind. We want that mower. In fact, we want two mowers, right? I, we, we want do. two mowers. Oh, we do. Yeah. We only so it's one transformative, there. but there's transformative and there's very transformative. This, this is a it is. It, this, I mean, this, it's, yeah. we need to be a leader in this. Do you know how much, how much gasoline is used to mow? 
Yes, I am yeah. not quibbling over the importance of an Thank electric you're... lawnmower. I'm, I'm electrifying my house step by step. Um, but I think that the the distinction between ARPA and, and what to do when you have more general fund dollars is different, just to my mind. It's, you know, as it was explained to us, too. How can we use money to leverage money? How can we use the money to, right, it's, leverage something? It's only 18.5 compared to the I understand. <laughs> I'm just trying to get us a little bit more. <laughs> but my, under, my understanding, though, is Jesse isn't interested necessarily in us making a final decision tonight no. um, and, and wait until we see the FY25 budget. So I, I think this conversation is great and it starts to or help to hone down where we might go, but we but it, don't need to come to consensus. Right. No, it's more to my mind in knowing how much we truly have left. I can give you, if, if you are interested in keeping going down this path, I can give you um, a quick preview of what you'll see in the FY25 budget related to these specific items if you'd like. If, if you're not ready for that and want to wait until the, 20, to the fourth, that's fine too. Well, give us a little teaser. Sure. So uh, the Heinsberg Road Market Street Light Study, we are budgeting, it's about a... Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, or Martha, $650,000 project all in. So we are budgeting $100,000 in the CIP, and you have previously um, budgeted some funds for the engineering of this, and then we are using transportation impact fee, so we're trying to leverage that project through multiple different funding sources since it was such an expensive, unfunded uh, project in the past CIPs. Mm -hmm. um, in the parks capital CIP, um, we are budgeting that at 200000 for FY25. We also have about 100000 of CIP this fiscal year that is likely to roll over into next fiscal year, i.e. projects aren't kind of shovel ready yet. So that's a total of um, about over about 300,000, maybe a little more in parks uh, CIP projects. Certainly there is almost no limit to what we could do in the park. So I'm not saying it's enough, but there is those dollars available. Um, the parks master plan um, is one that is a one-time um, plan that we have previously talked about a lot at council. We are hoping to use one-time money for that and not build up tax capacity for it. It is about $150,000 to do that well. Mm -hmm. Paul is looking at me. And isn't the parks master plan in what you included in the parks capital improvement plan? Because I have... I have a different breakdown on my in my, in my notes from September 18th. I have 150 for the Parks Master Plan plus 130,000 for the capital improvement. And maybe I was selecting from a list. I wasn't doing it all, but I recall the same thing. I don't yeah. recall 400 plus for the parks. I recall yeah. it was 280. Yeah. That sure. That's not my how I capture it, but great. Um, uh, and then on climate action, um, you've received to date the two implementation plans, the transportation, impl transportation implementation plan and the government operations implementation plan. Um, together, those uh, funding recommend recommendations for FY25 were about uh, one point over 1.5 million. We don't think we can re reasonably bring you that. So we've gone through and figured out mm -hmm. what are the projects that are ready to go and will be hopefully done in FY25 and the staffing we need to get there. And we're anticipating that's about $600,000, a little over in capital, um, and um, $150,000 to $200,000 of staffing. So that's what you are going to see in summary on the 4th. So when well, on the 4th, is that something you could add to this this list in terms of other sources or the surplus mm -hmm. or yep. what we could use the sur surplus for well, too. right it's just uh, and just so we can match those up because I, I agree I mean there's overlapping uh, budgeting going on and um, it would be good to see if what's left in this what's more or what's more in this fund in mm -hmm. these funds right yep. thank you okay 
All right, other things. So my calculations, just for the arts and culture master plan, for the village green, for the parks capital improvement plan, for the climate action plan, for the system modernization and the pennies for path, I have um, $1,992,000. Just so. Can can you tick through those again, just so I'm yeah. clearly capturing what you're intending? The Arts and Culture Master Plan, the Village Green, yep. the Parks Capital Improvement Plan, the Climate Action Plan, the, the System Modernization, and the Pennies for Path Match. And the lawnmower. <laughs> this is why I put all the ideas and the on the list. <laughs> I want I that to come out of our. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with on the lawnmower. I'd also like to see uh, the affordable housing uh, requests uh, but that's on the list. A budget thing, not a opera thing. But how is the lawnmower not a budget thing? And sure, it's sure, an sure. ARPA thing. It is. Well, I think this Look, is I mean, it's highly, all, but, highly transformational. No, 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 but the, um, the housing a, committee request is going to be annual, right? It's an annual, ongoing thing. No, 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 no. Time. No, this was a one-time injection of funds to allow oh, Green Mountain. The evolving fund. Green Mountain Habitat, right. Oh, uh, well, okay. I mean, we really haven't discussed that, if you honestly. Sp yeah, I was hoping we could. If you strike okay. the village green, we get another million back. Well, I mean... <laughs> I'd love to remove the village green and get another million back for other things. Well, you heard Barb Service talk about I, the importance yeah. of giving children a room to play. Yeah. There is a playground right there. That they can't use when school's they in session. They can use when school's out. Yeah, which happens. And there's a park down there, and it's going to go over with a bridge to another park. I have to say, Tim, everyone I speak to about the idea of a village green is so... Excited, and then they don't know it's a million dollars. That's they, what they, they don't know. know. They know it's 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 not a trivial thing, but it's transformational if we can do it. I already spent twenty four million on this. Could we? Could we <laughs> so, all right. If you want to, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, we we have the. If the cash on hand is taken out of the four point one million and we have six hundred eighty nine thousand dollars and we take the three hundred and fifty out of that, which is the Heinsberg and Market Street light, yeah, I mean it, clearly we have limited funds in terms of all the things that Jesse listed um, and what we'd like to do. So are we going to arm wrestle on December 24th? <laughs> Sounds like it. You have 13 months to arm wrestle, so. <laughs> I'm going to bring my electric lawnmower. That's right. <laughs> and I'm going to demonstrate it. And Barb, I did see your, your camera turn on. Please feel free. Dis oh, does that mean you, you do wish to speak up? I, 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 I did, but I don't want to interrupt the flow of your conversation. Um, I understand what you're saying, Tim, but we are in desperate need of some place. The school, how do I say this carefully? Um, it depends on the day, um, whether or not those facilities are accessible. And I walk on that street a lot and I see children without a place to play. And if we don't protect some kind of space, we're having all these conversations about open space. Um, Mm -hmm. If we don't do something, we are missing a whole piece of the city plan 2024 that talks about quality of life. It talks about recreation. It talks about outdoors. And I would just encourage the council to think about that really seriously, um, especially as we look at city center. And I will say what others have said. I am not the first to say this. City center does not look like what many of us expected. And I think if we don't protect some open space there, um, it is a real disservice to all of the people who were in great support of the development of that area. Yeah. I, I think City Center Park is wonderful too, but it's not an open field. It's not an open green where you can use it for, for various things. I don't think anybody expected City Center to be 
a large open space. Oh, no. Well, that's not. That's not what the be. definition of city center is. And I don't want to get into this right now because we're, we're well, trying just. And we, let's just let's just take, you know. We'll, we'll agree that on the fourth, we'll arm us all over it. <laughs> okay. It looks like Jerry Silverstein wants to say something. Oh. No, I don't. Um, let me take it and get out of this. <laughs> oh, okay. Your green light was on. You Sorry. See, you see things I oh, don't no, see. That's okay. <laughs> I just it, don't the want default, you The default seems to be it keeps it on. Okay, that's fine. So if we're having um, city budget beyond this, in, in, in integrated into this list, we'll have a better chance to arm wrestle with right. more, more real dollars. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. I think that's true. Yeah. But I think, yeah, we're getting down now to... Sure, it's time. Yeah, this is the tough, this is the tough time. Sure. All okay, right. I'll make sure it's as clear as I can hopefully make it in the budget presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Otherwise, we'll be here to let you know. <laughs> All right. And we'll be the here a long time that evening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go back then to item number 10. And I think that Jordan Mitchell, you are here. Yes, great. And this is the Town Meeting TV Annual Report and Funding Request. Jordan Mitchell is the Co-Director of Operations and the Digital Archivist for Town Meeting TV, CCTV. And good evening, Megan O'Rourke, as well. Hi. Hi. Awesome. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, we just gave you a new trustee tonight. Oh, Wonderful. Yeah. 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 Sorry that we missed our first go around. But yeah. Yeah. Jordan, go ahead. Cool. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, as you just said, my name is Jordan Mitchell. And this is Megan O'Rourke, um, and so we're here to present what is our fiscal year 24, your fiscal year 25 budget, and give a little bit of an overview of the last fiscal year. Um, so last year, Town Meeting TV produced and supported 1,300 programs for our communities, and 362 of these programs was categorized as municipal coverage. Uh, for South Burlington, we produced 51 city council and DRB meetings. Other general programming included the swearing-in of the new deputy police chief, uh, Juneteenth celebration, east-west crossing walk bike bridge over I-89 workshop, uh, and the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance housing meeting that happened here at the library. Mm -hmm. uh, the contract stipulates production of five meetings a month, or 60 a year, and at least one uh, general program per month. Uh, we were a little under last year, covering 85% of the budgeted number of municipal pro programs, covering 51 out of 60 expected meetings. Uh, so I would encourage, as you have other meetings that might want to be covered within that, to reach out and we can we can cover those. I know the city council has been having um, some special meetings come up these last couple weeks. Of course, we're covering those. Um, so if there's any other things that feel that feel relevant, you know, really want to make sure you get the most out of that uh, 60 per year. Um, so Town Meeting TV is funded in large part by cable subscribers of Comcast and Burlington Telecom, and then municipal contributions help to cover other operating costs. This year, we are requesting an FY25 uh, municipal contribution from South Burlington of $23,152 for general operating funds. This is a 5% increase from last year's contribution, and you can see past municipal support requests um, on our packet page too. Not sure what packet page for you all, since I know your website's having a couple issues, but it's in the packet. Um, so secondly, we have an uh, exciting update from the legislator that we're looking for your support to help get over the finish line. CCTV is part of a statewide organization known as the Vermont Access Network, or VAN. Uh, we've been working for the last several years to find a stable and permanent funding source for community members, uh, community media centers across the state. We've been successful in receiving one-time bridge funding for the last few years while we did some research, and now we're ready to propose a, a permanent solution to the legislature um, with a bill it would establish a new community media public benefit fund uh, funded by communications service providers in the state, which would ensure equitable and sustainable financial support for local public education and government access organizations across the state, such as Town Meeting TV. To show support for our request, we're asking organizations to sign on to a letter of support. Uh, we will share this letter with legislators during the 2024 legislative session. Uh, this is not attached in tonight's packet, but I'm happy to share this letter. Uh, I believe I shared it with Andrea and Jesse. 
uh, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, lastly, I want to be sure to thank Travis Washington in the back of the room, one yes. of Town Meeting TV's field producers, um, and also Helen, who has been, uh, who was the Town Meeting TV trustee, uh, for your continued dedication to municipal coverage and community media. So, so thank you again for the continued partnership and for having us here tonight. Uh, are there any questions? I have yes. a couple of questions. All uh, right. Do you, can you describe to me, do, do you host your own a website and your your own um, server infrastructure for for all of the the meetings that are then played back. Yes, so meetings are posted to our own website cctv.org. Yeah. Um, also on our YouTube channel, which is where they're live streamed, so people can watch them instantly. Versus it takes a couple hours um, to get on our website, uh, and then they also air on um, Comcast 1087 and Burlington Telecom. And so you don't utilize any any cloud services at all to, to perform your storage and yeah we do yeah you, you you do we do both we have we have a server um, and a backup server infrastructure that we share with the media factory at 208 Flint oh you have your own your own server infrastructure that you share with the media factory well, we share a tech core with the media factory and we we have our own server system that we um, you, you house know. at that location. Um, and backup, and then we do backup to cloud services as you, well. You backup to cloud services. Yeah. Have you have you looked at just getting rid of your server infrastructure in, 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 uh, completely and just going all to cloud, and just paying um, like AWS to, to to house everything and to play back everything, and you just control, you know, all the indexing and. Yeah, the short there's a short and a long answer to that. Okay. And it's yes. Yes. Currently, we think that the way we're doing it is pretty economical. Um, believe it or not, um, to own our own infrastructure. And I'd be happy to discuss that with you if you have thoughts. Um, we're in the process, actually, of developing a fourth repository, um, and that will be um, with the Internet Archive for all of the material that we produce at CCTV. Um, and that Internet Archive service would be uh, a publicly accessible and, f you know, basically free service. Are you familiar with the Internet Archive? No, no, yeah. I'm not. So, so did you say that you you are thinking about moving to a cloud service? Well, we we're gonna have a we want we we feel to have an uh, we've undertaken over the last year a um, process to figure out that to to examine our archiving structure and our archiving system and having four backups right. is considered redundant and reliable storage and holding two of those in-house okay. one of those in deep glacier storage which is economical and then one on the internet archive is where we're moving towards i, I i'm not an expert in this i'm yeah. just curious because you know i was i didn't know if you had your own your own IT, you know, in-house IT service and, and, and server infrastructure, or, or whether you used a, a generic cloud service or not. So, yeah, we uh, have we have in-house IT folks yeah. who have to do in the world of IT. They are unicorns because they have to know video engineering. They have to know software as a service. They have to do desktop support. They have yeah. to do network engineering and infrastructure. And then we also work with ClearBearing. Um, which is an outfit out of Essex Junction that provides a sort of backbone support. Okay. I was just curious. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Andrew. Hi. So thank you for the presentation. Could you just um, explain me the formula for how you allocated the 103,610 request for fiscal year 24 among the six municipalities? That's a great question. Let me look back. So this all began originally when Comcast um, had a, there was a gap reclassification. So they had a general accounting reclassification and it created a $50,000 deficit just for our access center alone. And at that point we went to all the municipalities and we used the same formula that we use for allocating funds, which is, um, uh, a number that uh, is a, what is that word, a, a confidential number around subscribers. So, um, you know, we take a look at all the Comcast subscribers and all the Burlington Telecom subscribers, and that's how we allocate our resources, and that's how we allocated these 
municipal funds as well, sort of based on that same formula. Um, does that does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. No, it's just it's just um, curious that South Burlington seems to have jumped significantly relative to others between nineteen and twenty, and that presumably, I guess, based upon your answers, because you took a look at that point on that data, and that's oh. what it indicated. Yeah, I think that's because, you know, the original, in FY19, we wanted to come with that 24 and the 20, and we wanted to replace that full fund, and we knew that that was too much to ask. And so we went to, to folks and said, let's do this half this first year, half the second year, and then we'll do the regular uh, percentage increases over that. And you'll see Winooski um, opted to do that on a year by year basis at a thousand bucks a pop. Yep. This is really a way that we are asking municipalities to help cover general operating costs as we see cable revenue declining. And that piece that Jordan Mitchell mentioned about going to the Vermont legislature is another way that we're looking to replace cable funding as the way that pays for this service. Currently, for the last 35 years, this municipal coverage, this community media service has been paid for by cable subscribers, full stop. So anybody that subscribes to cable pays a peg access fee, and that serves, at, at one point it served the cable community because we had cable channels. We now have services that go beyond cable channels, as you know, and we have services that, you know, meet needs to provide hybrid support, which goes beyond the recording of meetings and just airing them on a cable channel. So while we've seen increase in demand for the services and increase in, you know, labor costs and technical costs, we are funding that still just with cable dollars for the most part. So this municipal contribution across the board is one way that we are um, expanding, what is that word, diversifying revenue um, to support this project that we hope is valuable to you in some way. And, you know, welcome and welcome your thoughts and insight, as Jordan said, as well, on other ways to cover the community. Jesse? Well, the, the, the cable surcharge is a federal thing, right? Yes. Right. It, it's part of the 1986 Cable yeah. Telecom Act, yeah. yeah. But there's no surcharge on just a regular internet connection, an ISP connection. Well, you can't tax the internet. And so part of the... You can yeah. tax the connection to the internet, can't you? Well, you can tax streaming services. But the state would have to do that? Well, the state does um, allocate a streaming tax currently that I believe goes to the general, uh, to the ed education fund. A streaming tax? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What percentage is that? Do you know? I don't know. They should add a town TV streaming tax. To yeah. <laughs> so the legislative, so the work that's going in front of the legislature and... Did I... Did I mess up the mic? Um, so the work that's going before the legislature is to fund. So for the last um, three years, we've had a general fund allocation to support all of the 23 access centers around the state. Um, so of that, um, you know, that was a million dollars that came and went to the 23 access centers. Town Meeting TV was the recipient of about 45,000 of that. Um, Alongside that is the legislation that we're going to put forth to come up with a different funding mechanism. Right now, it's considered loosely a poll attachment tax. The idea would be to um, take advantage of the fact that there's already a way of counting how people attach uh, cables to polls and that we could levy a tax um, that would then be um, allocated to support community media. It's still in the early days. We are expecting that to go into both the House and the Senate in January, but there's still more to talk about that. And of course, there's alongside that the potential to rewrite 
um, telecommunications law in Vermont. Um, the federal, the federal tele, as the to the extent that I can understand it, the federal telecommunications rules and regulations have not caught, kept up right. with current tech trends, and so you have, you know, thirty three states levy streaming taxes in different ways. Um, and Vermont does in, in their own way, and then many states don't. And then there are a number of other things that you could tax, and some states do and some states don't. And it, it, So it's going on a state-by-state -state basis until the federal government decides to rewrite the telecom rules, and hopefully with the public good in mind. It almost sounds like something that the communications union district should discuss a little bit. They want to get people hooked up to, right. you know, either fiber or, or cable for, for ISP purposes, right? But and it, yeah. And is, it's a, yeah. This You're, is an interesting, yeah. you know, byproduct of the, of the erosion of, of cable usage, right? TV cable, as yeah. we have a cord cutter sitting to my right here recently. Do we have one sitting to my right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and cord cutting is, is not the right word to use because you actually it's, didn't cut the cords to your house, you right? You still have yeah. the cable. The yeah. cable's still there. You're yeah. just not subscribing You're not to a using TV it. signal. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, and, and interestingly enough, you know, because the communication unions, because the CUDs are so new, they are, they, I, I do not believe they're going to be subject to this poll tax at mm -hmm. this time. I think that that would be contrary to the initiative to build out broadband. Right, right. So and just, just yeah. so it's a P-O-L-E tax, not a P-O-L-L. -L. <laughs> yes, tax, P -O -L -L. a P-O-L-E, yes. They're like, poll yeah. tax? It's like, no. Yeah. Oh, it's a P-O-L-E, <laughs> telephone yeah. poll. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. and anything that I get wrong is solely my mistake <laughs> in this, because this is not uh, my, I'll, I'll say, and I didn't really introduce myself, Megan O'Rourke, and I am the co-director now of CCTV, Lauren Glenn Davidian, who is our executive director, has stepped into public policy role. So she's working for, with the Vermont Access Network to push. Um, she's basically doing her highest and best good work now in the legislative arena to continue to figure out ways to support the work of community media centers around the state. And Vermont will be a leader in that in the nation. So. We're excited about that. Jesse, you wanted to say something? I just want to echo the praise for Travis. He is highly competent, friendly, and dependable, and we are very, very thankful to have him. Yeah. yeah. And he's also heading up our media education program, which we're really, really super excited about. So besides helping you all here, he is leading the work to with youth and um, in the media education realm, which teaches both um, media literacy technical skills and civic engagement work. So it's pretty awesome. Very good. Larry, did you have any questions? Oh, uh, no, this I don't. Is, OK. Helen, did you have any questions? No, I just hope we um, continue to, to support them. Yeah. I, I think a 5% increase is um, warranted. And um, the only other thing I would suggest, I know we've talked in the past about having our um, planning commission meetings televised. Um, and maybe since we're not utilizing all of our um, number of, of um, tapings that we could think about and work in conjunction with the planning commission to maybe identify some critical ones that, that they have that might be of real interest to the community. Yeah. And I think we have talked with you and given you a number of what that would cost on top yeah. of, yes. we've, yeah, so you have that, you have those numbers as well. And that can be billed on a per meeting basis or can be, you know, you can put in a, a an overall additional, you know. Contribution. Right, I think to, 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 to the table. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Megan. I think to tape all of them was like fifteen thousand dollars. Does that sound right? I think thirteen. Yeah, I would have said it was thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's anywhere okay. between. And I do you want to? Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, it's anywhere between five and seven hundred per meeting. Right. 
Okay. They're they're taped and archived. They're not live. Not live. They're not, not live broadcast. Well, you could do. They're not live broad. You could do. So there's a variety of ways that you can look at utilizing coverage. So you could have us live stream to YouTube the way that we're currently doing right now, mm -hmm. uh, with titles, etc. You can send us recordings that are just Zoom meetings that we can add agendas to and add to our archives as well. So I, each of those things are, all of those things are option. And we really encourage you if you do have things that you're holding on to and don't have a way of archiving or are not archiving currently to add those to the Town Meeting TV archive of South Burlington Municipal material. Good. All right. So I would, um, so consider request, is this where we actually approve or do we wait for the budget discussion to do that formal approval of that? Yeah. So we have built in this request into our FY25 budget that will come to you. Okay. All right. Great. Good. Thank you, Helen. We're going to miss you very much. Thank you. Uh, Helen's leadership. I mean, you're very not, yeah. Um, Helen not only served as the president, but was our treasurer and will be hard to replace. So, thank you. <laughs> well, we're sending you someone good, so. Yeah, we're excited about Corey. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You're welcome. And happy Thanksgiving to you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. All right. And we have already seen item number 13. Um, I'm sorry. So we're going to do 11. <laughs> it says glasses again. <laughs> Um, discussion and possible action on the acceptance of road and stormwater infrastructure on Sadie Lane. And we see our D Public Works Director, Tom DiPietro, is in the room. And, sorry? Colin's going to likely speak on this. All right. And our City Attorney, Colin O'Neill, is also going to speak to this. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Tom DiPietro, Director of Public Works. I uh, wanted to chat with you all about Sadie Lane this evening. Uh, so this is a development uh, off of Dorset Street. Um, it has reached completion and they've got their final coat of pavement down. That's been down through the warranty period, a two-year period. Um, and so the systems out there are eligible for city acceptance. Uh, we've been working on that for a little while now through a variety of issues, uh, but we're here primarily to talk about tonight and what's sort of preventing this from moving forward or why I'm not recommending that council accept the road at this point um, is generally a speaking of stormwater issue. Uh, so the development is served by a stormwater detention pond uh, built under some older standards um, and the city has an ordinance, our stormwater upgrade feasibility analysis ordinance, where we sort of say here's the standards that something has to be built to uh, if the city's going to accept the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, those standards get changed by the state of Vermont periodically, and we update our own standards to sort of mimic those. So that happened back in 2017, uh, which was when the state changed their standards, so we in turn updated ours. So now um, these older pond systems across the city require upgrade in um, this one. So in, in the memo, we talk about tier two and tier three, things like that, but basically taking it from a pond to something that's better at removing phosphorus, a uh, real driver for those stormwater technical revisions was uh, phosphorus removal. Um, and so the pond isn't there at the moment, so that's why I wasn't recommending that we take it over the road and the pond. Uh, my memo goes on to talk about um, an alternative path here. So with a lot of folks, we have agreements that kind of specifies responsibility. Uh, once we get those signed, that allows us to take over roads or become co-permittees on stormwater systems typically. Um, and so that would be a path forward. Um, if council wanted to consider that. But um, we have been speaking, we, Colin and I, have been speaking with Homeowner Association representative. Uh, George is here with us tonight, so I certainly am um, glad he's here because he can give um, you all some additional commentary and perspective from the homeowners. Um, and so I think I summarized generally that in the memo, but I'm, I'll pause now in case there's other clarifying questions you all wanted to ask. Could you describe that agreement a little more and what our response is going to be? would be and what the HOA's responsibilities would be and um, what would happen if the HOA defaults. Yep. Um, so 
we've had this template agreement for quite a few years now. Um, and so whenever we take over some infrastructure, whether it's a road or a path, any impervious surface, mm -hmm. uh, those state permits, <clears throat> um, they run with the land. So we're required to become a co-permittee. So we wouldn't want to do something like take over a rec path, for example, right? I'm speaking generically now, and then be on the hook for everything that goes along with that state permit and all the requirements. So generally, these agreements say basically what's on city property or in a city right of way, we'll take care of uh, what's on private property, the other co-permittee or the owner of that property would take care of it. Um, and that allows us to sort of clarify uh, kind of roles and responsibilities. Oh, it talks about permit fees. Um, and then if someone were to default, so that permit, generally speaking, runs with the land. So if, let's say the other party on that agreement didn't do their share, didn't do the maintenance or whatever was required, uh, they'd probably be subject to enforcement by the state of Vermont. Well, so I think that would be a discussion. There's always a risk there when there's a state permit and we're co-permittees. The state may or may not recognize the agreement we have, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's not their agreement. That's our agreement. That's there for sort of <coughs> city and protection of sort of everybody that's paying into the rate system, right? Those shared costs. So, yeah. Ten or eleven? Nine. Nine. Uh, ten this is a lot. Larry and Leslie Williams nine house sub Act two fifty development, right? Correct. Yeah. Why is the stormwater ponds? Can, can I ask? Of a question? course. <laughs> Where whose land is the stormwater pond on? Yeah. Well, I, it's it's the original. Yeah, that way people at home can or yeah. whoever's watching can hear you. There's a little green. Identify your please pond. yourself too, please. Okay, uh, my name's George Thompson, mm -hmm. so I am uh, part of the board of the HOA. Um, so currently, uh, Lot 1, which is uh, 7 Sadie Lane, is the owner of the pond. And Frank, they're, they're the owner of all the land where all of our stormwater exists. Um, we have an easement to operate the uh, stormwater. So all the maintenance and everything like that is what we're responsible for as the association. Um, and that's part of the agreement that was set up by Larry Williams, City Lane LLC, and the, and the association. So that stormwater pond is on the, the inside of the of Sadie Lane to the west? This, it's, it's this Correct. southwest yes. corner? North and west. Of, yeah. of that? Okay. Because yeah. it's, it's in the corner. And that's on the Williams property? That's on the, well, it's on... Uh, it's that that has been sold by Larry and that was sold in oh, 2016. Okay, so somebody yep. else bought it. Somebody from else them. bought it. Yep. Okay, and but they're not part of the HOA. They are not part of the HOA. No, but they are on the infrastructure. So are, they're on the the sewer system, and they're obviously part of the stormwater. So part of their of their property stormwater goes into that pond. Yes, the pond and the four bay and oh, okay everything everything the uh, the wetlands. Everything that's on that side of Sadie Lane goes into that pond. So I'm going to ask a, a naive question. Is it possible to subdivide that stormwater pond out into common land for the HOA if the owner agrees? Certainly they could subdivide. So that's something that needs to be discussed or? Yeah, no, I will, I'll typically say, so we don't take um, land over, right, when we agree to manage stormwater systems. We typically get easements. Right. So someone else would own the land, and whoever that is, I guess... Um, as long as we have access, we're fine. But but you say here that um, because the land does not appear to be on land owned or controlled by the HOA. Yeah, that might have take been. Take longer. That might, so we had a meeting a, two oh. or three weeks ago, and I think one of the one of the things that came out of, of that is, is I was like, we don't own that pond. It's not ours to deal with. And I think subsequently mm -hmm. over the last few weeks meeting with our lawyer that – the pond is ours to maintain. Mm -hmm. The association is responsible for that, but we have no ownership of the land whatsoever. Okay, because it belongs to this other lot. It belongs to that lot. Okay. Yep. Is that it, does, does that lot landowner part of the HOA? No. Oh. No, and no. they've expressed to me that they want the pond, so they're not in, inclined that they had an opportunity at, at first when they bought to subdivide that and do something with that. Um, but I had a subsequent meeting with them after ours, and uh, they're not inclined 
Do, I'm speaking it, for them, but I, I, I'm just saying our conversation. Do, does that complicate the in, the improvement to the stormwater capacity? Mm -hmm. If so, if they, it sounds like there's a third party involved in making that decision. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, if the HOA can't give us an easement to access that pond for maintenance purposes, the other, the, the, the owner would. Um, and then we would have to bring them into this agreement in some fashion. So that's a detail to certainly be worked out. Well, so from our point of view, uh, there's there's a, an irrevocable offer, a warranty deed that grants you that right without that owner being involved. So that's that's what we have right now. We have we have the easements and this uh, the document that uh, transfers that to the city um, brings that forward to the city. So you just assume those easements. Yeah. So the the underlying issue really is this. this Moving the pond or upgrading the pond from uh, tier three to tier two and tier one, and who pays for it? Mm -hmm. So, um, the document that uh, you know was uh, um, agreed upon by the city and Sadie Lane LLC, which is Larry Williams, uh, says that the city will take the infrastructure over, whereas, as is, sorry, as is, where is. Um, and there's no documentation or no verbiage in there that says the city has any <clears throat> any ability to dictate different terms, meaning you really have the choice to take it or not take it. And that's kind of where the association is because the agreement on the stormwater really just leaves us with the entire maintenance cost of the stormwater itself. So, which is, we're a nine-house community. It's hard for us to, uh, it would be hard for us to, upgrade the pond so why would why would we take it under those <laughs> provisions of a is that the agreement as we understand it so yeah so let me, why would let me, we want to pay for it all let me back up a little bit so so as part of the approval process for this development they were required to give us an irrevocable offer of dedication for Sadie Lane uh, and the stormwater system um, that is included in an irrevocable offer which has been given to us back in 2016, I believe, 15, 16, when this development was approved. Um, since that time, we've, we've looked at this issue. We've determined that it's likely that this deed that they've given us includes a stormwater pond that, that we think lead, needs a lot of maintenance that Tom was talking about. And so what we proposed is we'll take over the, the city lane uh, of the roadway itself, but exclude the stormwater pond, and exclude this infrastructure that is not to our standards by ordinance. Um, and our understanding at this point is that the Homeowners Association does, doesn't want it to be parsed out that way. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they're saying if you're going to take over Sadie Lane, the roadway, um, you have to take the stormwater pond with it. Um, and, kind of, and so that's why we bring it to you tonight, because um, we're at a, you know, a bit of a, a roadblock, if you will, um, in that in, in, in Mr. DiPietro's memo, he, he references that because the stormwater pond isn't up to our grade, we're not recommending taking this, accepting this deed as is, which would mean that we're not accepting Sadie Lane at this time. Um, and so th that, that's where we are right now. Maybe this is a question for executive session, but I'm not sure you answered Megan's question. I mean, and, and maybe the executive session, I, I, I'd kind of want to know what our obligations are versus their obligations, and that would help mm -hmm. me then be able to figure out what, what I think we should do. <laughs> I mean, have we ever <laughs> denied a request for the city to take over a public road? What, uh, to, to take a road, a private road, yeah. and, and make it a public road? Have we denied that before? So, yeah, we, we've had many conversations where somebody will build a road, and then we'll go out and do an inspection, and we'll mm -hmm. give them a long list of uh, things that don't meet the approved plans mm -hmm. uh, or don't meet you know our standards for roads or will be maintenance issues and things like that. So yes, uh, we've also told folks in the past that we wouldn't take over these older systems. Um, so even before our SUFA document, our ordinance got updated, you know, there were ponds out there that were just for flood control that then had to provide better treatment for smaller storms, right? Mm -hmm. So as the state stormwater rules evolved, so did ours. Um, so we've, we've said no to folks as well. Um, typically those upgrades have happened. Uh, I think the, the issue here is that the upgrade of this one now, the upgrades that are required to take an existing stormwater pond from that tier three to a tier two practice, 
are more expensive than they were previously, right? Uh, so, you know, have to go to a gravel wetland type system. Uh, so they're a little more significant under the new treatment standards than they were previously, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and while I'm speaking, I just want to say one other quick thing to add on to what Colin said. So mm -hmm. it was sort of just one line in my memo. Um, but there's a number of developments around the city that are, um, this issue will come up. So I don't, I'm concerned about setting a precedent uh, because there's other stormwater ponds out there. Um, and so if we start taking them over, um, then we're going to have those costs added to sort of the, the rate payer rate for stormwater in the city too, those upgrade costs. Yeah. And is this specifically linked to the state improvement in, in the statute or are there other factors that would require upgrades? Um, yeah, so we, we just referenced the Vermont Stormwater Management Manual, which got upgraded again in 2017. They're actually working on another upgrade now, uh, roughly every five to, I don't know, or more years, I guess. They, they go through an upgrade. How did the Nolan Farm Road stormwater improvement work? Who, who paid for that, and did, did the um, Pinnacle Association pay part of that? Yes. Um, so at that particular one, if I remember correctly, Tim, I think we had already owned that road. And so there was cost sharing involved there and there were grants involved there. Right. A couple of grants, if I remember correctly. What about Dorset Park when they, they um, put in all the stone in those ponds and improved the dams, right? There's a, there's a dam at the end of it. Yeah. Um, Basically the same answer. So answer. we had already owned that road. Uh, we did some cost sharing, right. uh, got significant grants in that case as well, yeah. did the upgrades, and then took over that infrastructure. And the cost sharing is usually like uh, normalized by the amount of area that each party is responsible for, whether it's mm -hmm. their yards and the roofs or it's the actual acreage of the roadway. Is that correct? Yeah, it's impervious surface. Impervious so if we, surface. if we own 50% when we own a road, we pay 50 cent right. percent. Yeah, okay. So is there opportunity here, perhaps in the future, to, to follow that same path if there were grants available to to upgrade this pond? Well, certainly, yeah. I mean, you know, assuming future grants, right? right? Um, right. Mm -hmm. and, and you have a, you have a, I think you, last time you were here at a previous meeting, you said that there was a, a pretty good model for an agreement like you have with Spear Meadows for, for plowing a road that you haven't taken over yet, right? Yes. Um, so we recently put that together. Uh, Spear Meadows was the first one we brought to you, but we're discussing a few others to clean up that plowing situation. Yeah, where we're currently plowing roads that are private roads right. uh, with sort of city equipment without kind of a clear right to be on those roads. Um, Shady Lane falls into that category. So I was hoping we could resolve this whole road issue so that we wouldn't be in that situation any longer. Um, and that's at the end of the memo I did write in, you know, if we're still working towards a resolution here, we should probably put together one of those agreements with Sadie Lane mm -hmm. just to clean that up while we work out the rest of the, the other issues. Um, but if there's no intent uh, to move forward and make this a public road, then we should also have a discussion about how we separate from that um, responsibility without leaving them kind of short here, it being late November already. Because your interest, um, Mr. Thompson, is to have us take over both. It's when you say all or nothing, you really want all. I mean, that's uh, correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, per the document and the agreement that was made by the city, um, you know, that said the grant of property will be used for A, a road, and B, stormwater. And it says that the, uh, the grantee of the city acknowledges and agrees that it has received all the necessary as-built certifications, test results, and per all, uh, performed all investigations it needs, deems necessary to accept the above-mentioned improvements as is, where is, condition. And that was in... Uh, February of 2016 that that was entered into the city. So based on that, you know, I mean, it, it's our opinion that the city entered into agreement freely, knowing that there would be expenditures assigned to that. The only thing that they didn't know was that when those expenditures would happen and what they were. And the only difference today is, is that you know what they are. Thank you. And Andrew? And that's our main argument. Is, is Assuming the, that we believe the city is not responsible to upgrade the stormwater, um, what is the benefit of us becoming a co permittee? It sounds like there's Finding potential liability for us if we were to do that if the HOA defaults. 
the, the benefit for us for becoming a co-permittee? Yeah, what would be the benefit of that solution to us, to the city? Um, so I think it gets to more of a general question, I guess, to answer that. I'd say the general mission here of the stormwater utility is to help kind of improve water quality by working with the associations to upgrade and take over these systems, right, going back a bit. So I think the benefit is more of a, a community kind of global watershed benefit. Um, but uh, if you mean from like a financial benefit, right, there's no financial Well, I mean, you, you, you're suggesting that we become a co-permittee because... It would maybe oh. help us reach some kind of agreement. Because if we take the road, we have to be a co-permittee um, on the state permit. But why would we want to do that? Why would we want to? Why would we want to take the road then? So I think that goes back to um, what Mr. Thompson was talking about. So when the DRB approved this, right, as part of that approval process, um, the applicants required to submit warranty deeds and irrevocable offers of dedication, right, for the proposed project. Uh, that we can then later use and to take over that infrastructure. So, so th those were part of the, of the final approval, right, for the final plat. That's the yeah, yeah. right. But that doesn't imply that the city has has to take over, has to accept that irrevocable offer, right? No, not in my opinion. They, no. That's a separate agreement that has to be signed later on, right? Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Colin? Not a separate agreement. We would just have to accept the deed that we have been given. Accept ownership of the road. Accept the deed, right. Yeah. But we haven't accepted it yet. We have not. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll, I'll just note, if maybe folks aren't familiar with the process entirely, um, we often get easement deeds where we have to modify the one that was approved at the DRB level right before we do a final approval because something changed during construction or, you know, an easement or a, a property line had to move. So it's not uncommon that we edit these deeds mm -hmm. and IODs. That, that happens frequently. Well, so it sounds like the immediate thing is that we snow is coming and we don't want you to have to shovel your own road. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Well, yeah. I mean, that's one aspect. Yeah. I mean, it's really, you know, is the city moving forward, like I said, as is, whereas, or not? And we need to make our decisions financially with uh, what right. we need to do with snow removal and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly the, the city has been plowing our roads since 2019. Yeah. Um, frankly, we thought this was a done deal back then. Um, uh, and it just has come to light, <laughs> I'll say recently, but within the last year or so, there's a gentleman who wants to develop two houses, extend Sadie Lane south and develop two houses across the other side of the bike path. So um, that's kind of how we, you know, because we got asked, the association got asked, why haven't you uh, signed over the roadway to the city? So. I mean, I will add that there's there's four offers. So there's there's also the infrastructure for the water mains, the sewer that is under the rec path, and the rec path itself. So those are all bundled in this thing. Um, so what do you mean bundled in this well, thing? It's the whole. That's what what defined the whole development in the first place. I may be saying that incorrectly, but maybe Tom can. Or the the bike path is not part of this. There's there's four irrevocable offers. I believe it's four irrevocable offers. One is for the roadway. One is for um, stormwater infrastructure that's not included in the roadway. One is for a rec path. Um, I missed it. Sorry. Yeah, it's the roadway is the road and the stormwater. Then there's the water main that's in the Sadie Lane right away. There's the rec path that runs along Sadie Lane and ex and hooks up to the bike path behind Cider Mill, and then. Uh, and then there's a sewer main that's underneath the rec path or to the side of that as well. Those are the four offers. Yeah, yeah. that's correct. I misspoke. The sanitary sewer line uh, and, a, and a water main in addition to the rec path and the roadway. So are we going to be seeing this in the future then, the rec path and the water main? And I, I think so. We've had conversations about all four. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that, that I just want to highlight, just to answer a question that maybe came up earlier, is the irrevocable offers of dedication. Each one uh, has, uh, it's an, that's something that was accepted by the city that was signed by the, by the city. Uh, and it does have a section in there that says, nothing herein or in the development review board's approval shall obligate the municipality to accept said offer or to assume any responsibility as owner or otherwise of said public roadway, stormway, stormwater infrastructure and easement um, so there's no, ob we sign an agreement, but yes, there's no obligation in that agreement for us to actually claim ownership of these until we actually claim ownership of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so yes, I think it, there's a, there's a potential this could come up before. 
uh, you again each irrevocable offer um, as we've been discussing um, maybe has a component that the city isn't interested in taking that would require a little bit of, of uh, massaging uh, and so if if we're in the position of um, you have to take them as is or, or not take them at all that, that's that's where we are right now it sounds like that's where Mr. Thompson is that's in right, the homeowner. Exactly. So I don't that see that your your recommendation as a possible third way is is actually being entertained by Mr. Thompson, being a co permittee. Is that something that's being entertained by the homeowners association? Well, I mean the the agreement that was presented to us, uh, no, um, the agreement uh, you know split the stormwater fee. The state stormwater fee, uh, 55, 45, um, 45 for the city, um, but put the onus on the association to maintain everything else, which is not what the irrevocable offer says. The irrevocable offer says the city would take the the whole infrastructure as is. When, so when we decide to, I'm sorry. When we decide to. When you decide to, yeah. And we're saying we're going to decide to do that after it's up to, you know, state code. Right. So. Right. So I guess your answer is no, then. <laughs> answer is no. I guess that's. that's fine. I have another question. Was I, that I'm not trying to. So is that really the issue that. Yeah. It, it really comes down to the association doesn't feel that it should have to pay to upgrade this pond. And based on conversations I had, and I don't remember her name with the stormwater division, but this could be upwards of $100,000. Mm-hmm. So it's not money that we're looking to spend. Mm -hmm. There is no financial benefit for us to upgrade the pond at this point in time. Are the two proposed houses uh, part of your development? Will, will they be? They wouldn't be. So it's separate. Not be part of the association. They won't. Okay. Not so be they're not going to be affected by this stormwater. They they wouldn't be served uh, they by. They can't. They don't have access to the lots okay. unless it's through Sadie Lane. Uh, that would also hold up any uh, future development going north so as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Helen. So is one of the, is the rub here that when Sadie Lane was developed, there was a. Uh, mm, you're going out. You've been perfect until now, Helen. You froze. Yeah. You might want to try going out and coming back in or turning off your camera. To save some of the bandwidth. Cellular water. I'm not sure she heard. Helen, us. yeah, we Quiet. can't we can't hear you very well. Yeah, if you could just turn off your camera and try again about what the rub is. A particular um, storm environment, and that built, and then. That was built in the course of the and to the I'm, I'm Helen? All right, so you didn't hear anything I said? We no. did not. <laughs> yeah. If you could start with this, okay. is, this is what the rub so my, is. So my question is, <laughs> is. Okay, so is the rub that when Sadie Lane was developed and the requirements for the stormwater pond were X, and now over the Yeah. Helen, we're not hearing Seven. you. Someone's watching a video. Yeah, we're we're <laughs> we're encouraging you to to put into the chat your comment and question, so that okay. we can. Okay, I I actually will close out and try again. Okay. All right. W while Helen's doing that, so is the problem that the association then will have no incentive obligation to otherwise upgrade the stormwater? And so we're just going to have stasis and basically not a great stormwater situation there unless we do something? Um, the concern would be that at some point the state of Vermont, like they've done in past old permits, will say, okay, anybody who's got any of these old detention ponds from the 
mid 2000s that's no longer acceptable so you have to upgrade them right. to this higher level of treatment right now Instead. and so at that point yeah there will be costs but associated who would, with upgrading required to incur those costs if we don't accept the offer is it the, on the homeowners association the permittee it would that still be the, ours yeah. yeah okay okay yeah it would still be ours so you see no interest at all in, in sharing that responsibility. I mean, you might. But, well, That's with all some... honesty, I mean, once we lose the roadway, we let we lose any leverage whatsoever on getting the stormwater taken over by the city. That's the way we read the agreement. There would be no incentive for the city to take over the stormwater permanently. I'm talking about the incentive for you. I mean, if you're going to be you know, the one who's responsible ultimately, and it's just getting more and 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 more expensive. Where does it get painful enough where you say, you know what, I, I'm willing to negotiate city. <laughs> well, that's what we're doing here today. Right. Because, well, because if we go under the current agreement, it's still, regardless of when that stormwater pond gets upgraded, it's still the association. The current agreement though was not agreed upon. So that's because that's it left it, it sorry I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. It, it left it left the upgrade of the pond solely on the association. Right. So whether we enter in the agreement or not, we're in the same boat. We have a stormwater pond that we are legally obligated to maintain right. through the agreements that were set up um, when the when the um, when Sadie Lane LLC set up the uh, um, the underpinning documents for the development um all that infrastructure maintenance was written in that it was passed to the association so regardless so the only way the association doesn't doesn't uh remain responsible for all of the infrastructure maintenance cost is if the city takes it over otherwise we have it both ways or that there is some cost sharing that's, that's not what the agreement was. The agreement well, was. the agreement can be taken or left. So the city's saying, we're going to leave it, but here's another agreement. And that's where you might be a little bit, you know, think think again about how how we might want to renegotiate. Solved. But we're, right. we're operating on the agreement that was presented I to understand, us, which was but I, yeah. basically 200 bucks a year yeah. of, of cost uh, re, uh, reimbursed to the yeah. Uh, association. Yeah. Helen, do you want to try again? Well, you may have touched touched upon it, but I, and I think you just did. It, it seems to me the rub is what was built as a stormwater retention pond with when the development was built has is now is required to to be improved to a, a better level, and that's more costly. And, and that seems to be the rub. No, nobody really wants to pay for it. I guess at the city, if we could find some funds to help pay for it, that would help. Or if there are grants. But I agree with you, Megan. I think we need to negotiate, if they're willing, some kind of shared payment if this is going to go forward. Right. Right. Because I think that the agreement they had, I mean, it. it you still have to... I think you still have to attain the state requirements. And if they've changed in the interim, they've changed and you need to improve them. But at this I mean, is that right, Colin? Excuse me. Yeah, yes, uh, Madam Chair, you're, you're correct. And I think Tom can speak to that a little bit too about the standards that were in place when this was built as to the standards that are in place now. Please do, Tom. Yeah, no, um, <clears throat> that, that is the rub, right? It was built under an older standard. Uh, there's a newer standard. The ordinance that council approved requires that newer standard, right, in the SUFA document, the Stormwater Upgrade Feasibility Analysis. And so it's really that cost sharing. Um, in other positions, like Tim had asked, we'd already owned roads, right? We'd already accepted roads. So we were already a co-permittee. Um, in some of these newer cases, we're not. Mm. Was that pond, was it sufficiently designed when it was originally built? I'm just curious. Did it, did it meet the standard at that time? It received a state permit. It did receive a state permit. Okay. So it was an existing pond. Right. Um, the engineer added a four bay for pretreatment before it got to the pond. Okay. 
and they added a new outlet structure. So they were able to get it permitted, this existing pond, as sort of their stormwater pond. Right. And the outlet is to the south underneath Sadie Lane and underneath the path? Yep. Okay. I mean, it's our understanding that there is actually no requirement right now. We are not obligated to upgrade the pond. There's nothing that says we have to do that. I think if you're over three acres, you have to. So we're, we're at one point to. Oh, that, that is correct. There's nothing saying they have to upgrade it. Yeah. The, the state of Vermont, that permit is not saying that Sadie Lane has to upgrade right now. That, that discussion is being triggered by the question of city, please accept the road. And then again, going back to our ordinance and our standard, which is the current treatment standards. Right. The, yeah. Right. Okay. But I'm sorry. I thought you said, though, at some point the state will come in and require an upgrade. It's my expectation. Yeah. I mean, it's happened numerous times, yeah. um, even during my you know, time here in South Burlington. Yeah. So we're willing to negotiate, but we need to have a partner willing to negotiate. <laughs> I think that's what I'm hearing from my my fellow counselors, Mr. Thompson. Well, if there's another uh, agreement, we certainly will uh, entertain that. Okay. You know, review it and go through our, our discussion internally. So, I mean, we met as a community on this on October 1st and everybody in attendance, it was seven, seven out of nine, six out of nine maybe, to zero were absolutely this, the way it was set up, the way it was presented to us was not a benefit to the community mm -hmm. at all. It was, it was a financial burden that we didn't feel we needed to, uh, to do. One, one more question. Is there enough area to, to improve this stormwater pond the way that you think it should be done? That's a good question, Tim. Um, no one has looked into what it would take. Okay done the engineering to say if we were going to, you know, retrofit this pond to the new standard. So I wouldn't want to hazard a guess at that. That's a really good question. Though. But, but, but presumably, question. but yeah, that's a presumption. Right, right. Yeah. Would it, could it potentially... And it would have to be done on the man who owns the pond, right? right. He doesn't want to give up his pond because that was a pond when he built his house. And then it, it became, also became a stormwater pond. Right. Correct. Is that right? Yep. So and, well, and I think it, anything to do with the maintenance, stormwater maintenance of that pond, the association right now has the right to do it without that homeowner's uh, yeah. permission or not. It, it's, it's in the document. Oh, that was okay. But I think what Tim's question has to do is if we have to, uh, in order, and I'm we as a collective, right, um, to increase the size of that stormwater pond in order to be up to state code, you know, that's that's something that just maintenance won't do, right? So that would require even perhaps a bigger easement. I mean, is that possible? That, that's not uncommon. Um, yeah. But again, I wouldn't want to say what exactly would be needed right. in this case right. until right. we you know, spent the time and effort to look at it with an engineer. Right, right. I mean, I could speak on the homeowner's behalf on this one thing. They are uninterested in spending any money on that pond. And, you know, they, they bought the house from Larry... Williams with their documents saying that they are not responsible for any maintenance of that pond. I believe specific to stormwater. That's so lot one. That's lot one with the pond. That's lot one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would also comment that there is a, uh, um, and I don't know if you've ever looked into it, but there is a, there is a lot of stormwater that comes off of Dorset street all along there, all the way up to the cider mill. So the cider mill, uh, next gen, a couple more houses, um, then you have lot 10, which is part of ours and whatever, that is running along a ditch, go, cutting, making a 90-degree uh, easterly turn, following right down to Sadie Lane and draining right into that pond already, So, which actually floods um, during storms, floods around the uh, lot 1 barn, that's that existing fixture that's there as well. Mm -hmm. So there is probably about 50% of the stormwater, rough guess, maybe 40 uh, that's coming from the city of South Burlington's uh, um, mm -hmm. roadway and whatnot already going into that. Mm -hmm. Or so. the other properties of the that front there. Right. I'm sorry? Or the other properties at the front there, right. not just Correct. the road. Right. Correct, the road and the properties that are there, yeah. plus the cider mill, plus next gen. It's either going in through that ditch or it's flowing backwards into the wetlands and coming down that way. On the eastern side. On the 
on the western side of Sadie Lane. So you've got, okay, right, you've got two, right? Yep. Okay, well, what I heard you say is that you're willing to look at new language that the city might propose. So I guess that's where we might have to leave it. And we, we hope that there can be some room for agreement and it I <laughs> it sounds like there will be a maybe a few back and forths <laughs> but there may be yeah do, do we want to ask if it's a good idea to proceed with a temporary plowing agreement like they have for spear meadows is that something that we want we agree on that, so, that should go, move forward yeah, let me let me jump in so that, that was my recommendation if we are going to talk about future or different agreements that we move forward and get this plowing agreement in place, we can do that pretty right. quickly. Okay. Um, if the answer is no, we're not interested, then yeah, I, you know, we would want to talk something different. But it sounds like we'll talk further. So I will also put together that plowing agreement. There's a, a fee that goes along with that, right? George, it's nominal, but um, so I'll put that together as well. And you can consider that. And then I would bring that agreement back to council at a future meeting. So. All right. And if you know, I think that sounds like a good plan. People. <laughs> Sorry, Helen. That sounds like a good plan to you. I said I think that sounds like a good plan. Very good. All right. Thank well, you. thank you very much, Mr. Thompson, for coming in. Thank, thank you, you very much, time. Tom and Colin, and happy Thanksgiving. I'm your neighbor. Oh, yeah. Royal Drive. All right. So yeah, Colin is staying. Um, we had a request for, uh, and not from the school board, it, it came from a community member for us to take up um, the uh, one of the conclusions of our charter committee to increase the size of the school board. And so um, Helen and Jesse, in their meeting with the superintendent and chair of the school board, raised this. Um, the school board is um, has not yet come down to any specific request to, to make of us. So tonight is basically uh, to give anybody in attendance, and I don't see a member of the school board, um, here, um, but also us, um, what we wish to do, um, you know, with this final report from the Charter Committee. Um, and that is just kind of an open discussion, uh, kind of exploratory. We, we had told the Charter Committee that this was going to be something that we'd come back to. And um, Can so I here we are. One yes, please comment. do. So the school board during the charter committee process did um, submit a statement of support to ex extend the school board. Right. Um, what they haven't weighed in on is the separation of that discussion from the expansion of the council conversation. Oh, I um, see. So the idea of moving one ahead of the other is what's kind of in question right now, not the school board has previously stated that they would support mm -hmm more members. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so I am, I'm, I'm just going to remind the last time that we discussed this, this council did not appear ready to um, discuss expansion of the council or any change or, or make any change. Um, is that something that you took away from the meeting that if we, our position is to decouple them, that it's no longer an active discussion for the school board, or they just want clarification on where we sit um, with regard to the charter committee recommendation. So what, and I see that Elizabeth Fitzgerald just turned her camera, her mic on. Yeah. Um, I think the quite from me, I agree with 90% of what you said. I think from staff's perspective, um, the last time you talked about the Charter Committee recommendations, the decision was made to pause and have additional conversation in the future about representation broadly. Right. Um, so then community members asked the council to move the school board expansion forward on its own right. for town meeting day. And so the question for the council is, 
are you interested in decoupling those? And because this got on the council agenda last week, the school board hasn't had a formal opportunity to weigh in on it. So I think that the process question for the council is, we are now under a really uh, tight timeline to get something on the town meeting day ballot. Right. So if there was a majority of the council that wanted to consider decoupling, we need to give direction to the city attorney to start drafting language. And that would also, you don't need to take any other action tonight other than ask him to draft language. And that at a future meeting, if the school board was interested in coming in and providing testimony, um, they could do that before you warn the public hearing. And I think you would need to warn the public hearing no later than your second meeting in December, and you would likely need to have a special meeting in January to hold that public hearing. Okay. So that's just a process yeah, so moved. thing. Okay. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> what you said. Okay. All right. So we'll see where that takes us. All right. Um, discussion. Uh, Elizabeth, did you want to say something? This is a member of the Charter Committee and a former school board <laughs> director, of course. <laughs> Um, yeah, I actually, I'm not really authorized to speak on behalf of the Charter Committee, but I was, when I saw this agenda item, I was going to encourage the Council to consider decoupling that, because I think there's been a lot of consensus um, to move forward on expanding the school board, mm -hmm. and given the runway to kind of have public hearings and then get this um, through Council into the Legislature, um, we're still looking at, even if it's decoupled, for the school board alone, I think we're still looking at probably a 2026 implementation. So I would encourage the council to direct staff to at least develop the language so that um, there's the potential to get this on the ballot. Okay. All right. Are Thanks. There, yeah, thank you. Any other discussion? All right, I heard a motion in a second, right? Second, yeah. Okay. Uh, Helen, oh. Oh, Colin, please. I have a question. You can wait till after, but my, my question is more form. If you if you do elect to, to move forward in this way, um, right now the, the charter is doesn't speak to the number of school board members. It refers to state law. State law allows for three, scored three school board members, and if you have a public vote, you're allowed to have two more uh, with one or two-year terms. So right now the school board has five school board members. According to state statute, yes. they're, and they're limited at five? They're limited at five. So under state statute, they're limited at five. Um, the charter would obviously, if it's our charter, uh, it would also become state law and would become the, the controlling precedent for that. Um, it would override the current state law. Uh, so the so the decision that would be helpful to make right as, as well, back up a little bit. So as you know, the, the city of Burlington, I believe, has 12 school board members. That is under their charter, which allows them to have 12 school board members. Um, so... In, in a way that if we're considering a charter change to um, include the number of school board members, the, the world is uh, it's kind of our oyster. Um, but at the same time, that's a that's a big um, ask for to have me draft something um, without more direction. So it, it would be the number of school board members, maybe what their terms are um, in terms being the, the number of years that they would serve all that information I can come up with and, and come back with something, but any guidance you might want to offer would be helpful. Well, I think the two to three year terms is generally, um, you know, something that is usual or expected, at least for our community. Um, and I don't know, I, I haven't done the math, I, that puzzle of having seven as opposed to five but it seems like there could be some rotation there just by adding two more people who would just be. Yeah, so right now, just uh, under the state statute rules, there's three school board members with three-year terms and two school board members with two-year two terms. Right. Um, but as we're changing, as we're coming up with our own um, number of school board members, we're not bound by that. You can come up with your own... Um, terms w would it be untowards to ask colin to work with the school board chair to see how they would like to set it up i think it would probably streamline it if he came up with something then they could vet it at their meeting that's what i would suggest because she probably would want to speak with the school board before representing the school board on this just based on past two more people one three one two yeah, that's kind of how I feel too. Let's see how that goes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
we're adding to then add. I like that idea too. Yeah. yeah. And then the ability to add two more after that, and then two more after that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And do we want them both entering in the same year, 2026, say, the first year that it's adopted? So we want to have four members of the school board elected all at once? Sure. You don't want to stagger it, one one year, the one the next year? I sort of think you want them, if you're going to increase it, you want to increase it. Okay. And while, you know, it might be problematic to have four running, it could happen on its own. We should have room for it on the ballot. Yeah. Having the number of, that, that, that number of interested parties. We might charge them for the extra printing on that ballot. Just kidding. It's worth, it's worth it. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I guess for me, it just seems like that's a lot of training to do. <laughs> you know, let's say you get four new members out of a seven member board. That's a lot of training to do. You know, it's so the majority as opposed to, well, I guess then it would be an odd number as opposed to an even number for that one year. Mainly that's be two true. people. Right. Two other people. Right. Get on. right. You know, some people might get reelected. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. I think so, but if Tim could just repeat what he had said about what the terms were, I I didn't catch it. Two new people, one three and one two. Three years, one two years. Yeah. One thirteen and one twelve. No. That'd be good. A thirteen year term. Yeah, that would. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, and we still need our vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. That's all of us. Thank you very much, Colin. And we have already had our discussion of the use of the ARPA fund, so tune back in on December 24th to see uh, us wrestle. And <laughs> it's a moment for other business. Um, just one thing. I've, I've been talking to people at work, and they're like, what the heck's happened to Williston Road? You know, it, it used to be two lanes this way and one lane, and when they're like, and they're like going, it's different now. It's but it, good. It, I, they think it's better. Yes. So yeah, so that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Right. And as somebody I know pointed out, that flowing north on Dorset Street seems to be a little bit less congested now, maybe because the lights are changing. You know. Oh. Maybe, but and the warranty period's over, then the sensors will take over, then we might get even better flow. So, and I noticed that Aspen Drive is just blinking yellow right now. So maybe that because they're getting ready to do something there. But thank you for that because I hate that light. Because <laughs> well, it's like it sees me and it goes, oh, Tim, uh -oh. turn it red. <laughs> it's they get to the high school and says, here sensor. comes Tim, turn it red. So I would just, if, if counselors are getting questions about this, if you go to uh, the city's homepage to the scrolling news, there's an article on lane shifts, including um, a really lovely video um, that Andy Brombar, our communications coordinator, and Erica Paul has put together and voiceover. So if, if people are getting questions, please point them in that direction. It helps m make sense of the patterns in one's head. Nice. Yeah, Andrew? Can I, I know um, the council used to um, allot a little bit of time to talk about climate change updates. And can I, can I give a quick one? Sure. So the fifth national climate assessment came out a few days ago it's the it's every five years it's commissioned by the federal government to give the state of climate change in the u.s and just to read a few of the things mm -hmm. so i didn't even realize this climate change is costing the u.s 120 billion dollars a year mm -hmm. they've now concluded the science is irrefutable it's the first time i've ever seen that statement where it's all the scientists are saying yes we are causing climate change. It used to hedge a little bit, like 90%, 80%. Now they said, yes, we are doing it irrefutably. So that was um, an advancement as to what the science is willing to say. And the conclusion is we must swiftly reduce heat trapping emissions, enact transformational policies in every region of the country to limit the stampede of devastating events and the toll that these events take on our lives and the economy, while the U.S. has made progress, our progress is woefully insufficient. So I'm really proud of the efforts that we're taking on that front, particularly given this report. 
and one lawnmower. <laughs> Well, we're doing a lot more than one lawnmower. I think we want two lawnmowers. <laughs> yeah. I, and and the curve conversion, we're, we're now going to, we've just uh, agreed to solar. So our house incrementally is becoming electrified. But what we learned through the process is only so many households can be approved for that at a time. Otherwise, the converter can't take in that much elect Right, the transformer. Thank you. So there's just a lot that we're working against. There's a lot we're working against. And, and on top of that, the fact that there might not be capacity in a neighborhood for charging electric vehicles, because mm -hmm. then a lot of houses don't have the amperage right. for the service. So if you increase the, all the services, then you might need a new transformer. You might need something else on the pole as well. So right. it all goes hand in hand, and you know, we're getting there. Right. Slowly. Right. But something I would really like us to consider, I know that it's happened in Montreal where they have taken existing neighborhoods and added geothermal and that a neighborhood is in fact, you know, the climate control is, is dealt with through a neighborhood geothermal. I, I just, I think that there's got to be something in addition to most of those systems solar. are owned by the municipality and in Vermont, we don't have the authority to construct or do one of those, but there is a bill right now in the Vermont legislature to give municipalities that authority. Oh, good. Who is introducing it? It's being introduced by the Geothermal Alliance. Good. Is it because of district heating in, from Burlington, from the McNeil, primarily? Uh, it may be related to that. Um, I'm not sure how what they're doing. They may have separate authority. I'm not, I'm not sure, Tim. I haven't heard it linked up like that. I've heard it more generally in the state as a, as a problem. A lot of so there there are new developments being built in the country that and, and around the world, other countries too, where they it's a planned you know um, geothermal bus that's included to every house, right? So every house gets a flow of fluid that's that constant 50 degree underground water temperature that they use. Hmm. in their heat exchanger, you know, for, for their heat pumps, mm -hmm. right? Because mm. you're either you're either shedding heat from your house into this 50-degree heat sink or you're pulling that, that warmth out and heating it a little bit more to get it up to 70, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to trying to use air on a cold night, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or, or hot air on a hot day, right? So right. I, I would love to see more accessible, accessible geothermal for residential, I, but it's it means digging, drilling, yeah. messy stuff. In some places you can't do it, um, and it's expensive. Right? Yeah. So there, if there was a, a technology breakthrough that somehow made it a lot cheaper, so that when somebody put a heat pump in, they put some sort of ground-based you know, heat sink in as well, that'd be great, but mm -hmm. we're waiting for that. Right yeah. Now. Something else, and since we had a teacher here tonight, um, I want to give a shout out to Mr. Basden, seventh grade um, fusion social studies teacher who uh, showed seventh graders, including my daughter, um, a video about the, the DACA um, uh, textile um, factory uh, that collapsed in 2012 in Bangladesh. And had the kids think about where their clothing comes from and then think about the cost um, that goes into everything, you know, where these people make so much money and this item of clothing makes this much money for the company. Um, but also to think about, on the other end, how it, it's important to employ people and how it's important, you know, f to to get people um, to... to contribute through their employment to, you know, the, um, the, the wealth of a country. Anyway, I just, I thought that asking those big questions of seventh graders is, is a really important thing. So when we think about energy and we think about educating the end user, like our people in our schools and, and their parents, um, I think it starts conversations at homes. And I think that there has to be a culture shift. I mean, I, as I said to my daughter, I said, you know, we read the Little House in the Prairie book series, and they probably each had two outfits each and their night clothes, right? They're like, two? <laughs> Unbelievable. And I said, well, you know, maybe that's where we have to go. 
You know, that's maybe something that Mr. Basden might be opening your eyes to, um, that there, there are things to, uh, that are invisible to us in terms of our energy consumption. You know, having things shipped from all over the world and, and made in, the, in one country, you know, globalization has, has probably done a lot to increase our global emissions. So having seventh graders, you know, really wrestle with that, I think is an excellent exercise. And also thinking about those people in Bangladesh needing to be paid, needing to have, you know, a livelihood. So it's, it's all a big picture that I, I think yeah. that, uh, you know, in addition to thinking about how we heat and cool our homes, our, our cons consumption practices and all these things that we have to think about as well. And it starts at home, right? I want to get on to the executive session. All right. So would you like a motion? Very well, yes. So I move that the council enter into executive session for the purpose of discussing the negotiation or securing a real estate purchase or lease options relating to the Scott and Long properties inviting Jesse Baker, Steve Locke, Paul Connor, and Colin McNeil into executive session. And should I also say that we will be making, we're probably voting on the energy so I would just ask you to add the and to consider appointments to public and to consider bodies. appointments to public committees. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We, will not, we will not be coming back. All right. Very good. This meeting will now not be recorded. <laughs>